table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we brought it. This is the first time Gary and I have ever seen. All right, I call to order the July meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents, and we will begin uh, our meeting today with recognitions and introductions. And uh, President Gable, will you please join me at the podium? Mr. Chair and members of the board, on behalf of a grateful university, I would like to recognize Gail Klatt's tremendous service as Chief Auditor of the University of Minnesota. For the past 27 years, Gail has been an exemplar of the university community, leading with great expertise and tenacity. She's known for being an honest and dedicated colleague with an excellent sense of humor. I have truly enjoyed working with and getting to know Gail, and along with the rest of the university, will miss her incredible partnership and skill. But we also wish her the very best wherever the future may take her. Thank you so much, Gail. Where is, where is, oh. There you are. So Gail, <laughs> Gail I just want to um, add a few uh, words to Jones. It has been such a great pleasure to work with you and you know, watch your professional excellence over the last several years that, that I've been a regent. I think you helped, us, you helped us in so many ways. And I just want to talk about a few of the things that you do so well and have done so well and have meant so much to the university. Um, for those of you who like to think about auditing and what it can do, I think, first of all, you know, you thought so clearly and deeply about the, the, the risk profile of the university. This is a big place, lots of things, a lot of moving parts, lots of things go right, but things can go wrong. And you helped us think really clearly about where that risk is and, and, uh, and, and how we're going to focus on it and get ahead of it. You also brought real expertise to once we've done that, so what are the problems and what are the solutions? And you were great about identifying here are the things that we need to fix, but you were also great about leaving, uh, leaving, you know, leaving room to the teams to figure out the solutions and giving them some latitude. And I think the result of all of that was that you are, you are so credible and so highly trusted within the university. And uh, I think it's just a great a testament to your to your skill that you're 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 the auditor, but everyone I think sees you as you've you've elevated the institution. You've really helped build the institution, and we're so grateful to you for your service and your team service uh, and the way that you uh, led them. So I just want to read um, from the certificate of recognition. Um, the regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with sincere gratitude and appreciation the dedication, service, and contributions of Gail Klatt. As the university's chief auditor, Klatt established a state-of-the-art and innovative internal audit function that is highly regarded by colleges and universities across the country, and that's true. She's a leader in the audit profession, often called upon for advice and counsel from her peers, and has received several national awards for her contributions to the audit profession. She served the university for nearly 27 years, first joining the Office of Internal Audit in 1994. During her tenure at the university, Gail has proven to be a strong and a talented leader by consistently applying her expertise and that of her team to identify opportunities for improving management control, efficiency, and the university's image. She greatly increased the value of the university's internal audit function. Under her leadership, the Office of Internal Audit steadily protected and enhanced the university's organizational value by providing risk-based, objective assurance, advice, and insight. Gail's nearly three decades of service have had a significant impact on the University of Minnesota, and her impact will be felt for decades to come. On behalf of the university, the regents extend their respect and deepest gratitude to Gail Klatt for her outstanding service to the University of Minnesota, and we wish you the very, very, very best.
and we hope you will say a few words. <laughs> Thank you really, really for those really fine and kind words. And um, I have to say, I've been doing this for 27 years, and it has been truly a great gig, really. Um, and I so appreciate um, the support. Uh, since the day I came to the University of Minnesota, I was hired by a member of the Board of Regents, Regent Bill Hogan. And um, Bill was unique in that he was, um, had experience as a provost at the University of Kansas and also as an entrepreneur. So I came out of industry and he understood that, but he also understood how the academy was quite different than, than industry. And he was so generous with his time with me to explain that difference and, and how our work needed to be done in the context of um, support of the academy. And so from that day on, and for all the regions that I've worked with over the years, um, that support has really been unwavering. And, and that is absolutely critical to a role like mine at the institution. I often, um, not often, it's not, there's always the likelihood I have to deliver bad news or difficult problems or issues. And I've never had to worry about how those messages would be received by the board. Um, they've always been supported, supportive of me, always had my back. And that's just absolutely essential in a role like mine. Um, and President Gable, I will say, you and your predecessors, I have served five presidents. Um, they all have been unique. Um, they all wanted to leave their own mark on the institution. Your story is still being written, and I will watch it with great interest. But um, I have just so valued the inclusion of the senior leadership and, and the presidents, both President Gable and, as I say, those who preceded her. Again, that has just been essential to my ability to carry out our role in the institution, to understand what those priorities are and how we can use our work and effort to help support those. And I would just say on a personal note, President Gable, I just consider myself so fortunate to have had a tenure long enough to be able to have the opportunity to work with the first female president of the University of Minnesota. Pulls at my heartstrings. <laughs> I would also say one of the just absolute benefits of, of my role and, and the work we do within the institution is I have the opportunity to work with people throughout the entire university community, from the very senior folks who you know populate these rooms here in McNamara to the frontline workers, and to work with people who are so dedicated and are so committed to public service and the mission of the university is just heartwarming on a day-to-day -day basis. And I get to engage with extraordinary people doing absolutely extraordinary work. And in my role, um, I can't help but be a lifelong learner because every single day I learn something new associating with people at the university. And so for that, I am just so grateful um, that I, I Think back to some of my um, best experiences were those that involved engagement with faculty from around the university. And I have to say, they think different than I do. <laughs> and being in, in, um, in productive engagement with them just broadened my mind. And I would, I would leave those just humbled that there's a whole different worldview than Gail Klatz, you know? And that was really good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So um, just the intellectual stimulation that every single day I had the opportunity to enjoy. Um, and um, I also have just had a privilege to be associated with wonderful, wonderful internal audit professional colleagues that um, we've had probably 100, give or take, come through our doors. And each one, some have lasted decades. Some have stayed with us for much less time, but they all left a mark. They all um, create a collage in my mind of just people dedicated to being public servants, 
wanting to advance the mission of the institution. And I thought Regent Powell made a, it was um, quite, I don't know, serendipitous um, about um, that I gave people latitude to, to come up with solutions. And um, that actually harkens back, and I've told many people this story, so if you've heard it, you're gonna hear it again. Um, but um, very early in my tenure at the university, first month or so, I had the opportunity to engage with a faculty member in the um, School of Epidemiology. We were talking about an audit issue related to his research, and he was very respectful and he understood and he agreed he could do something to you know, shore things up. But he said with great compassion and great um, caution um, that it was very important for me to understand in my role that the people that are driven and, and attracted to the academy are those who want to push the envelope. They want to discover new knowledge. And they cannot do that if there are too many rules and restrictions that constrain them to the proverbial sandbox. They needed to get beyond that. And so that it, would, it was just very important that I carry out my work in a way that did not hogtie faculty. Because he said then, what you will end up doing, and I just loved the phraseology, it, it like took my breath away, you will suck the lifeblood out of the academy. So I, that has stayed with me. I hear that man's voice with his passion and his caution frequently um, throughout my career. And I have tried to embody that in how we approach our work and how I lead my function so that we do no harm, that our work does advance and not constrain the work of the academy. And so with that, thank you all so much. It has, like I said, been a great gig. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I will continue to for my next couple months here. And then I will watch from afar the institution continue to be successful, continue to be the crown jewel in the state of Minnesota and its North Star. So thank you.
All right. Thank you. Thank you again, Gail. So next we're going to have the introduction of our incoming Vice President of Human Resources, Kent Horseman. Vice President Horseman, you join us, please. Mr. Chair and members of the board, I'm very pleased to introduce Ken Horseman as the new Vice President for Human Resources. Ken served as Interim Vice President for Human Resources since January of 2020 and has exhibited incredible leadership, flexibility, and endurance during the COVID-19 pandemic, a truly challenging time for the entire university community. He has the ability and has already shown how he creates and fosters a strong working relationship with a variety of stakeholders, both internal and external to the university. He has a collaborative and consultative nature in his approach to leading and people. I couldn't be happier to introduce Ken to you in his new official capacity as the leader of the Office of Human Resources. Ken, can you say a few words? Thank you, President Gable, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. It would be remiss of me uh, not to share this moment with others so critical to the role of human resources here at the university. Over the past 18 months, we have exhibited that we have an incredible team of HR professionals and leaders at the university, both in our office as well as in the academic and administrative units and system campuses. I am thankful also to our faculty leaders in shared governance and our labor representatives who have been critical to the work of the last year and a half. And my sincere hope is that we continue to build our relationships now and in the future. Whether you are a partner in shared governance or labor or in a human resources function, your candor, your support, your responsiveness, your willingness to be transparent has all uh, led us to this moment and helped us through a challenging time. It has been an honor to serve in the interim role as VP of Human Resources and support the incredibly important mission of the University of Minnesota during perhaps one of the most challenging times we have experienced in our lives. President Gable, your leadership and guidance and support has been nothing short of inspiring in purpose and accountability to the mission of the university and its people. You have in your short time built a team of leaders that works well together and shares differing perspectives candidly and supportively. I look forward to the contributions and value human resources at the University of Minnesota can bring to the system-wide strategic plan impact 2025 as we move forward. I am, I am humbled and thankful for the opportunity to now serve as the Vice President of Human Resources and I thank you. Okay, continuing with our agenda, the next item is the approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. A second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No? no? No no's? All right, that motion is approved. That brings us to item four, the report of the president. President Cable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the board. Um, as we commence a new academic year and get closer to light at the end of this incredible pandemic tunnel, I want to take a moment to express my sincere appreciation to our university community 
for their patience and kindness, for their universal commitment to elevate and protect each other's health, well-being, and safety, including the incredible contributions from our frontline and healthcare workers, for their important thoughts and expectations they shared throughout the pandemic, including more recently what it might look like to live, learn, work, discover, and serve together as we embark on the fall semester. And in this spirit, I note with excitement our return to full capacity this fall. I also note that we've made important and difficult decisions together from our sunrise and testing plans to our decision not to require that students, faculty, and staff be vaccinated, although strongly encouraged to be vaccinated against COVID-19. We have grounded all of our decisions in guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health, the infection and vaccination rates of our campus and surrounding communities, and insights from our own internationally renowned public health and medical experts. This collective information and expertise has kept our COVID-19 rates at some of the lowest amongst our peers. And as we move ahead, we're putting the full weight of the university behind access to vaccines and information about the benefits of vaccines. Members of the board, last week, the governor signed the Higher Education Budget Bill, which included $38.5 million in new spending for the University of Minnesota, of which $38 million is an increase over base op in operations and maintenance funding, and $500,000 is one-time funding to the Natural Resources and Research Institute, or affectionately NRRI, for applied research. This new spending represents approximately 82% of the board's request. In addition, the higher ed bill also expanded the state grants eligibility for low and middle income families, especially those outside of the Pell Grant eligible range. Over 12,000 of our families will see some increase in their financial aid as a result, either through the Pell or the state grant program using fall 2020 estimates. And between the new funding for the University of Minnesota in the budget and tax bills from energy and commerce to health and human services, to environment and natural resources, amongst others, the state is providing the university over $95 million. So with sincere appreciation to the governor, the lieutenant governor, the administration, and the members of the legislature, and all those who advocated on our behalf for their support of the university in this biennium. With regard to safety, members of the board, there is a significant increase in crime in the city of Minneapolis, and that has impacted our campus community in very concerning ways. There was a recent off-campus shooting that you're aware of in Dinkytown that left three UMN students injured, fortunately none critically, but our thoughts and support go out to all of those impacted. In response to these and other safety concerns, we've been coordinating with the City of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Police Department, as we have all along throughout the entire nature of our campus relationship. And we are also, as a campus, taking the following actions. Um, police department members, officers, and otherwise will be much more present and visible during the late night hours when most of the criminal activity has been taking place. UMPD specifically will assign additional officers on overtime to Dinkytown and the Marcy Holmes neighborhood. And our UMPD will be working with MPD to install mobile cameras in Dinkytown and in the immediate areas. <clears throat> in the longer term, we're working on several things. Throughout the summer, our UMPD officers will utilize additional bicycle and vehicle patrols in our surrounding neighborhoods. We will be analyzing for more additional cameras in strategic locations for real-time monitoring. We will be examining where to install additional blue light emergency response kiosks in the Dinkytown area. And in, in coordination with the city of Minneapolis, we will be seeking additional street lighting in Dinkytown. We will also be looking at the formation of a dedicated safety ambassador program to provide a visible, friendly, on the street, pre on the street presence in Dinkytown and Marcy Homes. And we're expanding the university's broader engagement in Dinkytown and Marcy Homes, which will include work with the city of Minneapolis, community groups, property owners, and businesses to explore, initiate, and maintain a wide range of safety initiatives to create a safe and welcoming community for all. All of this work is done in the context of the work that we did with Dr. Cedric Alexander and with full recognition that safety is not accomplished solely through an increased presence of law enforcement. We also will rely on safety ambassadors, increased monitoring through cameras, increased lighting, use of the RAVE application, and other solutions that have been proven successful in similar areas, both regionally and nationally. And our MSAFE committee continues their work now more than ever to implement and review the recommendations from Dr. Alexander's report so that amidst this very concerning time, all members of our community can have their voice heard and feel safe in our efforts to reduce crime. Members of the board, at the May meeting, I updated you on the MSAFE work and that we are accelerating aspects of Dr. Alexander's recommendations. 
For example, we're conducting policy review and process around mutual aid and multi-agency response. We're advancing certain aspects of UMPD officer training, and we're starting to address the University Senate resolution related to demilitarization. Accordingly, in June, an MSAFE summer committee was charged with this work, and after already meeting twice, making really good progress on these important issues, and we will report back as that progress evolves. Um, with regard to the PRISM initiative, members of the board, in February, we had our official launch. PRISM, of course, stands for the President's Initiative for Student Mental Health. And last month, we announced the standing members of the PRISM committee and then the subject matter experts who will serve ad hoc. There were hundreds of nominations we received from students, faculty, staff, clinicians, partners, friends, alums to do this work. We were so grateful and actually really heartwarmed by the willingness of our entire community to invest in this effort on behalf of our students. So the next marker in the committee's work is an executive retreat, and I'll keep you apprised of the outcome of that retreat as they set their agenda for next year. In March, we also announced PEAK, which stands for Positioned for Excellence, Alignment, and Knowledge. This is a system-wide effort aimed at continuous improvement practices and promoting efficiency, which is a key commitment in Impact 2025. And so later in this meeting, you'll hear an update including the assessment phase and our planned efforts around consultation over the summer and into the fall as we prepare to share with you the roadmap at the October meeting, which will guide future design and implementation. There have also been a lot of events, some of which I've been able to participate in personally that I want to update you on. We had our first Fulbright Advisory Board meeting. We had the APLU's Presidential Panel and Council of Presidents Summer Meeting, the Council of Competitiveness, Technology, Leadership, and Strategy Initiative, and we had one of our scheduled MIAC meetings, which we commit to a minimum of three times per year, but are sometimes more frequent. We also did all of our on-campus work with EMPC, Cabinet, FCC, System Council, the deans, and then, of course, ad hoc meetings with chancellors, other campus leaders, amongst others. And members of the board, I would like to close my report as has become a happy practice with some shout outs that make us all UMN proud. A shout out to our College of Pharmacy for winning the 2021 ACCP Clinical Research Challenge Award. A shout out to the University of Minnesota's rocket team for winning the worldwide 2021 Spaceport America Cup. The University of Minnesota's quiz bowl team for competing on NBC's College Bowl. To our seven athletes who will be competing in the Olympics in Tokyo this summer and to go for athletics for finishing 28th in the 2020-2021 Learfield IMG Directors Division I final standings, third highest in the Big Ten and amongst the top 9.5% of all ranked schools. And lastly, as has also become a tradition, we have a video shout out for some other additional great happenings across the university. <clears throat> members of the board, as you saw at the end of the video, we're very excited about the new Impact 2025 website. We heard your request that there be a narrative, that there be a story. 
So this website provides easy navigation for the plan, some deeper dives around the core outcomes, metrics, and deliverables, and many thanks to the people who've led the way standing this up, Laura Johnson, Link Carlson, and members of their team. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, President Gable. We always look forward to your report, and we, and we like the video, too. It's all good. <laughs> Turning to the report of the chair, I'll begin my comments this morning by reporting on the work of the Presidential Performance Review Committee, which included Regents Swigum, Mehron, and me. The committee met with President Gable on June 29th to deliver her performance review, and as provided in state statute, that meeting was closed. A summary report of the review is now available to the public, and I'd like to highlight a few uh, of the key points. We first convened in May, and we met six times as a committee. Our process was highly consultative, including nearly 30 interviews with individual regents, university senior leaders, members of the faculty and student body, alumni, and legislators. And I wanna, we, we would like to thank everyone we interviewed. Uh, your uh, candid input was invaluable to this process. <clears throat> Feedback on President Gable's performance was overwhelmingly positive. Specifically, as a committee, we noted the following. President Gable led the university through both an evolving pandemic and civil unrest. She tackled tough issues in a decisive, balanced, and effective way. She drove to completion our system-wide strategic plan, Impact 2025, and all the associated metrics using a thoughtful, consultative process to establish the university's roadmap for the future. President Gable continues to successfully build and leverage a very strong and a very capable senior leadership team. And finally, throughout uh, the, the pandemic uh, and civil unrest, she remained visible, highly communicative, and deeply engaged with the university community and external stakeholders, and no small feat given the challenges uh, that she faced in the past year. As we concluded in our report, overall, President Gable's passion for the University of Minnesota, coupled with her formidable talents as a leader, have served the institution well during a very challenging year. She's the right leader at the right time for the university. We look forward to building on the momentum she's created now, at this time, I'll ask uh, Regent Swigum and Regent Mayron if they would like to add any additional comments. Go ahead, Vice Chair. Regent Swigum. Well, um, I think we want to enhance uh, what you said, uh, Mr. Pollard, Chair Pollard, about the uh, university community and reaching out to them and their willingness to partake in this uh, performance review. Tremendous understatement of all involved was that uh, our president is very, very, very good. And we are very glad that she is here to lead our institution. Um, I think very, very telling uh, was the fact that so many said uh, in, in our responses and our questions to them that uh, um, the University of Minnesota is President Gable. And President Gable is the University of Minnesota. And they're known as such, and uh, uh, Joan, Thank you for leading this institution through a couple of very tough years and a couple of really hopefully easier ones coming up. <laughs> you know, my takeaway from the what we did, the work we did, and what we heard is that there really are not, we're not strong enough adjectives to describe the performance of you, President Gable, during the year. Uh, they're, they're just, they're kind of, we're at a loss for some vocabulary to show how you really took us over the top in what was probably the most difficult year the university has ever had in its history in light of COVID and the civil unrest that took place. So, um, you know, we use these words in these reports, but I, I just want to give you a sense of the magnitude of the positive response that we got. And the other thing that really struck me from the interviews is that people would say, you know, even if we disagreed substantively with the decision that President Gable made, we nonetheless have enormous respect for her and the fact that she seeks our input and hears us and explains the decision even if we disagree is so important to us and enhances the trust and respect that they have for you. And that is just a fabulous quality. So 
it was a pleasure to be part of this performance review, and I will look for a bigger and better adjectives in the coming years. <laughs> All right, turning to um, other items, although the board won't meet again until September, we will be busy throughout the summer working to establish our priorities for the year ahead alongside with President Gable. Those priorities will carry forward into the board's agenda <coughs> development and planning and committee work plans for the year ahead. So I'll conclude my report there and we'll move to our next agenda item, which is the receive and file reports, of which there are none to report this month. So we'll move on to the next item, which is the consent report. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent report? So I'll moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, the consent report has been moved and seconded. Uh, I just wanna pause, we'll see if there are any region questions or comments on the consent report. Okay, seeing none. <laughs> Uh, I will ask uh, all those in favor of, the, of approving the consent report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. All right, that motion is also approved. <laughs> Item eight is before us for review and action today. We'll consider ratifying the Chief Auditor Search Advisory Committee appointment and charge. Early in our meeting, we had the opportunity to recognize and honor our outgoing chief auditor, Gail Klatt. As we celebrate her milestone, along with it comes the work of hiring the university's next chief auditor, something this board hasn't done in nearly three decades. As a direct report to the Board of Regents, it is our responsibility and reserved authority under policy to hire the university's chief auditor. AGB search and uh, Office of Board of Regents staff will support us throughout the search process. We've constituted a search advisory committee to guide us in this process. I note that this is an advisory committee to the board that does not hold any delegated authority to select chief auditor. The board will decide. Mr. Steves will review the committee charge and membership. Mr. Steves. Mr. Chair, members of the, the board, the, uh, the committee that is proposed is an 11 member committee. It includes three regents and then eight others who were selected from among senior leaders, faculty, um, uh, and others to, uh, who bring special knowledge and expertise to this particular search. There are, there are different kinds of searches that happen at the university and some of them are searches that require some knowledge and expertise uh, in, the, in the area. And um, internal audit is one, of those, is one of those special areas where there is value in having folks who um, have an understanding of the work that is done by this office and, uh, and can uh, help us seek candidates who will bring, um, bring the skills and expertise needed to enhance that, enhance that office. And so that is, uh, um, that's the, the group that you have in front of you to serve as a search advisory committee. As, as Chair Powell noted, they'll work in concert with our search firm, uh, AGB Search, to, um, to enter the recruitment phase. So today, as you take action on constituting the committee and giving it its charge, um, you'll be launching the search. And then they'll move into a recruitment phase where with, with the consultant, they will be um, building that pool of candidates, uh, you know, starting to, to screen through candidates, um, look at, uh, look at, at folks who could uh, be a good fit here at the University of Minnesota. Their charge that you are giving them is to return to you three to four unranked candidates. And so they'll, they'll take that pool and, and they'll, they'll narrow it down to three to four people that they think are the very best in that pool. They'll forward that to you. Um, that then launches kind of the evaluation phase. And that evaluation phase will include um, your ability to uh, select finalists and then uh, those finalists to have some kind of a vetting process um, uh, with, within the university community. Um, I'll note in particular that that we intend uh, at, that, at that vetting stage or when, when finalists are announced that um, we'll, we'll make a, a specific solicitation to uh, student government organizations across the, across the system uh, for their input in this process. Much of this work is happening over the summer months when students aren't necessarily here and engaged on campus, on campuses across the system, and so we'll make that a specific step in our process. And then, uh, and then finally, we'll, we'll move to the selection phase where the board will engage in deciding who the next um, chief auditor of the university is. 
And so uh, as you launch this process today, I think we have uh, before you a, a very strong lineup of uh, an advisory committee that will um, work in concert with our, our consultant and, and deliver you some excellent candidates. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Steves. Um, do you have in front of you or handy the members of the search committee? Maybe I, just to, I, I do. Uh, just to quickly uh, re, uh, re remind the board of uh, who's being proposed to serve on the committee. Sure thing. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the three regents who would serve on the committee are Regent Swiggum, who would serve as chair of the, of the search advisory committee, and then Regents Davenport and Kenyanya. And then the other members of the committee uh, would be Myron Franz, Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, Jennifer Goodnow, an Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota Morris and a Faculty Consultative Committee member, uh, Jennifer Gunn, Associate Professor and Director for the Institute for Advanced Study and a member of the Senate uh, Committee on Finance and Planning for a number of years, uh, Ken Horseman, Vice President for Human Resources, Boyd Coomer, Chief Compliance Officer, Jim Nobles, the Legislative Auditor for the State of Minnesota, uh, Michael Oakes, the uh, Interim Vice President for Research, and Doug Peterson, our General Counsel. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Steves. So I wanna thank um, everyone who's agreed to serve on this committee, uh, especially grateful to uh, Regent Swiggum, who's agreed to chair the committee, and Regents uh, Davenport and Kenyanya, thanks to the three of you for serving on the committee. So before we move to discussion, I'll entertain a motion to ratify the appointment and charge of the Chief Auditor Search Advisory Committee. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All right, colleagues, um, we'll turn to a discussion of uh, this resolution. Uh, any questions or comments? Regent Swigum. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the charge to this committee is extremely, extremely important. Our goal will be to uh, find someone so the committee does not have to be formed for another 27 years. <laughs> uh, that will be our goal if we, if we do it right. I see uh, uh, Regent Davenport, uh, Regent Kenyan here. Uh, I see Ken, uh, Myron, uh, Doug, um, and we're gonna do the job right for you. Uh, my guess is in 27 years, none of us are going to be around this table, unless it be President Kenyana. <laughs> but he may be the only one that will be here at that time, so we won't know in the, 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 uh, the performance of our decision, but uh, hopefully over the next four or five months, we'll be able to bring you a, a good slate for you to make the decision from. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate those that are um, willing to put their time forward for this. One of the, one, the, I guess the point that I would make, not, not fully knowing uh, how the membership will operate in this um, original identification phase, you know, one of the critical aspects of the auditor is that the auditor reports directly to the board. And that independence is really essential to have, you know, for for members of the board and the public to have confidence that, that audits are being done objectively and, um, and forthrightly. We've been very fortunate in that regard for a long time uh, now, as has been stated earlier in this meeting. And so I just, I wanna make, I, I wanna just make the point that being that the membership includes people that will be subject to the audit function of this position, that we don't end up with an interaction that creates a sense of obligation between the auditor and folks that are in the organization. And so that it really does come back and it's an independent decision by the board um, so that the person we ultimately identify and, and bring on board um, into this position is not beholden to anybody outside of the board itself and the, and the public uh, so that we ensure that, that we have integrity in our auditing function. Thank you. Good, uh, thank you, uh, Regent Rush, for the comment. Uh, others, anyone else wanna make a comment? All right. Uh, seeing none, then I'll just ask for a voice vote. Uh, all those in, in favor of the, of the composition in charge for this committee, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion's approved, thank you. All right, we'll turn now to item nine, the University of Minnesota Alumni Association annual report. It's 
with great pleasure that we welcome uh, Lisa Lewis, the president and CEO of the UMAA, and Mark Jassen, fiscal year 2021 chair of the UMAA board. We want to thank you both very, very much for, for being here. And uh, Ms. Lewis, over to you to kick us off. Thank you. Chair Powell and member of the, members of the Board of Regents, I'm pleased to be here with Mark Jessen, our virtual board chair for the last year, to share an update on the alumni and how they are making an impact on the University of Minnesota. Mark holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the College of Liberal Arts. He is the owner of Jessen Company, a full-service print, mail, display, and fulfillment company in St. Louis Park. He is also the co-founder of Jessen Media and part owner of University Gear. Mark and his wife, Peggy, have three children, all who, who, have, who have either attended the university or um, are in, at the university now and pursuing a degree. So Mark is going to start us off today. Good morning, Chair Powell, President Gable, and members of the Board of Regents. On behalf of the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, I'd also like to welcome and congratulate new regents James Farnsworth, Doug Hipsch, Ruth Johnson, and Cody Verhalen, and extend our deep condolences on the recent passing of Regent Her, a member of our alumni community and an impactful leader. It's been an honor to serve as the 82nd chair of the Alumni Association's Board of Directors, especially during a time that was like no other. For almost 120 years, the University of Minnesota Alumni Association has served as a bridge connecting the student and alumni experience from celebrating pride in the University of Minnesota to creating a worldwide alumni community to helping students successfully transition to their careers after graduation. The Alumni Association supports U of M, U of M alumni through every stage of life. And although the challenges of the last year have been significant, the alumni community stood together as it has for more than a century, supporting one another and celebrating their shared love for this great institution. Personally, the University of Minnesota has meant a great deal to me and my family. My father was unable to attend college, but insisted his four children could go to any college that they wanted, as long as it was the University of Minnesota. <laughs> <clears throat> Between myself and my three siblings, we have one Master's of Education degree, one Bachelor of Arts, that's me, I'm the underachiever, and two doctorates, including my sister, Leanne Moline, who's the current Associate Vice Provost for Student Success here at the U and a source of great pride for our family. Now my three children were given the same college option that my father gave me, which resulted in my oldest son graduating with a marketing degree from UMD while captaining the track and cross country teams, my daughter who spent four years marching in the pride of Minnesota and just completed her master's in education here at the U and has already secured a teaching job and my youngest son, who will be a junior next year in CLA, here on the Twin Cities campus, pursuing an individualized degree combining marketing, psychology, and speech communications. In other words, he's gonna get into sales. <laughs> uh, their mother comments uh, quite uh, frequently on the inordinate amount of maroon and gold in our collective wardrobes. But uh, what started as my father's inability to afford to go to college has resulted in two generations of golfers receiving world-class educations and going on to successful and impactful careers. My family is extremely grateful to the University of Minnesota. We'll start with the latest snapshots of the University of Minnesota's dynamic global alumni community. There are currently 608,000 alumni across the U of M system. 63% of those alumni choose to live and work in Minnesota, contributing to the state's talent pool as leaders in just about every profession and driving the state's economy as entrepreneurs and employers. University of Minnesota alumni reside throughout the world in 165 countries and span five generations. The Alumni Association engages this geographically diverse community and keeps them connected to the U of M through multiple channels. For instance, the Alumni Association currently supports 81 alumni networks, including 14 international networks, which represent alumni groups brought together around a wide spectrum of interests based on where they live or work, what they studied, 
or how they connected as students. Next slide. This large and diverse group of alumni are engaged. For the past five years, the UMAA has been measuring both annual and lifetime engagement of system alumni. Through the collective efforts of the UMAA and partners across the system, the number of engaged alumni continues to rise with 385,000 alumni having engaged with the U since graduation, representing 80% of all contactable alumni. And our alumni are generous. In fiscal year 2020, more than 38,000 system-wide alumni contributed over $214 million to the university, representing 59% of all donors and 53% of all giving. Now I'll turn it back to Lisa, our CEO, to tell you how we, the UMAA, adapted and led over this past year. Chair Powell and members of the board, over the last year, alumni continue to be significantly affected by COVID-19, but not, and also our country's focus on social justice issues and efforts to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. Alumni turned to the Alumni Association for trustworthy information about the coronavirus from U of M experts, as well as educational information on racism, career advice, the economy, and much more. In response, the association quickly, quickly expanded our digital offerings, which enabled us to reach the global alumni community across millions of digital touch points. We provided a wide slate of resources, opportunities, and information alumni told us were extremely useful to them during this time. In the earliest days of COVID-19, the association created a special weekly e-newsletter and website for alumni on the topic with concise coronavirus information from U of M experts. Faculty shared insights into public health efforts, offered advice, and helped alumni understand this developing crisis. During this turbulent time, we also continue to provide alumni with tools and resources that help them advocate for the university's legislative priorities to preserve the university's excellence. The pandemic dramatically reinforced the critical role of a world-class university during such a global event. And throughout the past year, the Alumni Association also continued to develop new revenue opportunities to support our efforts to ensure that we can continue providing resources that help alumni thrive. All of these efforts serve to advance the commitments in the university's system-wide strategic plan, Impact 2025. We particularly focused on these areas of student success, discovery, innovation, and impact, community and belonging, and fiscal stewardship. We'll share information about this with you today. Although the pandemic changed how the Alumni Association supported U of M graduates over the past year, we quickly adapted to this distance environment. In fact, the Alumni Association produced, partnered on, and coordinated 151 virtual events this year. Digital offerings included everything from speaker webinars and career networking to some of our signature traditional events that we turned digital, like many college and annual celebration. U of M faculty and others shared expertise on timely topics, provided information alumni wanted when they needed it. Topics range from creating transformative changes in policing, how to make working parenthood work, life amid COVID-19, network and job search strategies, and of course, return to travel. That was a hope. <laughs> this work wouldn't have been possible without the collaboration of our campus partners, including the President's Office, U of M Foundation, the Office of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion, and our talented faculty and staff. The pandemic year also had an effect on the types of programs that the Alumni Association presented this year. At the request of alumni, many of whom faced career challenges resulting from the pandemic, the association presented a wide array of career offerings. The disrupted economy left alumni eager for insight into this new landscape. These efforts included job search resource page, industry-based networking opportunities through our coffee and career series, and a new navigating your identity in the workplace series that discussed diverse event identities at work. In addition, we provided ongoing professional development opportunities through our master classes, which helped job seekers navigate career transitions and a virtual career month that drew 916 alumni and students. 
working closely with the career services offices in each of the colleges, along with the alumni relations officers, we supported alumni at every stage of their career. And as COVID-19 left many of us confined to our homes, alumni wanted content that they could access whenever they needed it. Goldmind, the Alumni Association's online repository of university expert talks and videos, was revamped this year to be more user-friendly and resemble a Netflix model with both original UMAA content as well as curated content from across the campus. This past year alone, multiple new videos and audio resources were added to Goldmind. These additional topics expanded the library of content by 188 hours. Goldmind now has over 420 hours of content in a variety of categories. So if you're ever bored and you want some intellectual stimulation, you can check us out on Goldmine. We also saw more than a 50% growth in users who watched videos in Goldmine this past year. Next slide, please. Yep. One example of some of the innovative and resourceful responses of the Alumni Association can be found in the Minnesota Alumni Market. Launched in 2017, this online boutique is the first and only shop in the world to sell only products made by alumni. This shopping experience gives everyone who loves the U of M a way to support alumni creators. It also provides an opportunity for established alumni entrepreneurs to extend their reach and helps new alumni entrepreneurs successfully launch their businesses. The market features everything from branded apparel to greeting cards to lifestyle products. To date, the market has supported 75 alumni from 66 businesses. These alumni business owners represent 12 different U of M schools and colleges and four system campuses. Next slide. In FY21, 15,000 purchases were made in the market by customers located in every state in 18 countries. This resulted in a 90% year-over-year increase in financial support to alumni businesses participating in the market. When face masks became a must-have item for every household and healthcare provider, the UMAA saw an opportunity to make a difference while strengthening the alumni community. Working with U of M public health experts and alumni entrepreneurs, we created a reusable maroon and gold face mask and began selling it in the market. For each mask sold, one was donated for use by M Health Fairview medical patients, their family caregivers, and students living in U of M on-campus housing. In April, the UMAA assessed the one-year impact of the face mask project, and the results were extremely encouraging. 27,000 donated face masks were provided this past year. Sales for alumni-owned businesses in the market rose 817% after the face masks were launched. In 2020, the market reached the top 1% in terms of growth of over 1 million businesses using the online shopping service Shopify. And while I can give you the facts and numbers, I'd like you to hear from the alum behind the masks and one of our Minnesota alumni market suppliers, Corey Kapacek. Hi, my name is Corey Kapacek, and I'm a 1998 graduate of the Carlson School of Management. When I was a student on campus, my buddies and I wanted to get season basketball tickets front row of the student section. We wanted to be the super fans at every game. But I had to graduate and, and move on to a job outside of the university. Then I got a call back because a position had opened up, a full-time position had opened up within the Gopher Marketing Department. One of the roles that I had in that position was to buy promotional products for, for the events. Now, 20 plus years later, our business is predicated on um, having venues like this full of fans. The NCAA canceled March Madness. And literally when that happened, it was like a switch flipped off. We, we had to figure out something to do to keep the doors open. Uh, the mask that we developed hopefully was gonna you know, carry us through for a few more months. It was the, the Minnesota Alumni Association that actually saw the opportunity. Um, you know, they shared my vision of what we thought the mask could be and we're actually able to take that a step further with their buy one, give one mask program. If, if it wasn't for their forward thinking, the project never would have got off the ground and we wouldn't have been able to donate 25,000 masks to you know, M Health Fairview and, and the university community. We were, we were hoping to sell 1,200 masks. The first day they went up for sale, I think they had sold 4,000 masks. Within a week, we had sold 10,000 masks. 
you know, this is way more than a promotional product. This was something that we were gonna be involved with that was potentially saving lives. The Minnesota alumni market did a fantastic job of, of, of hosting the product on their site. Um, and it really just brought everything together. The university is fortunate to have so many talented and entrepreneurial alumni like Corey, who took this year's challenges and turned them into opportunities. If you want to be further inspired, check out the story of Lee Wallace and Peace Coffee that is linked to your materials and can be found on the UMAA YouTube channel. And as Corey noted in the beginning of the video, his loyalty and enthusiasm started while he was a student. In fact, a strong student experience is foundational to a good lifelong alumni relationship which is why we start early in reaching out to students. The Alumni Association focuses on the fact that today's students become tomorrow's alumni. And we work to build connections, relationships, and community with students before they make that transition. We recognize the unique circumstances of this last year for students, and particularly for the new graduates. So we created opportunities to celebrate and support them and officially welcome them into the U of M alumni family. Students could showcase their U of M pride at a life-size graduation photo op outside of McNamara, which let them pose as if they were appearing on the cover of Minnesota Alumni Magazine, our alumni publication. In addition, messages of alumni encouragement and support were shared throughout graduation with these students. In addition, the Maroon and Gold Network, our online mentoring platform, allows alumni to share their talents and expertise with fellow alumni and help students navigate their career journeys. This year, we've seen a 44% increase in users of the platform, bringing the total alumni, students, and friends participating to 9,299. These events let us introduce students to the many resources the University of Minnesota Alumni Association provides. And they also help recent alumni realize that the relationship with the university is not just a few years, but a lifetime. Since the Alumni Association listens to alumni feedback, we know that the pandemic and social justice were top of mind for them this year. As a result, the Alumni Association has and will continue to share stories and resources about these topics across multiple platforms. Our weekly digital newsletter, Alumni Angle, provides segmented U of M related information in a timely format, delivering the most relevant content to each individual recipient. In addition, our quarterly and print digital magazine, Alum Minnesota Alumni, brings readers in-depth reporting on current research with context from U of M scholars and features profiles of prom prominent alumni as well as spotlighting important U of M research. A few of the stories we've shared this year include Sanda Ojiambo in the upper left photo, a Humphrey School alumna who helps fight climate change as executive director of, of the Global Compact at the United Nations. She talked with us about the unfolding climate crisis. Holly Chun Hyang Bachman, the upper right corner, former co-chair of the Multicultural Alumni Network and founder and president of the Mixed Roots Foundation, shared how individuals can support anti-racism efforts. Her foundation raises awareness and funds for the multicultural adoption of foster care community. And medical school graduate Nathan Chomolo, the bottom right, a pediatrician and internal medicine hospitalist who talked with us about co-founding Minnesota Doctors for Health Equity and the link between racism and health. Their stories and so many others make us proud of the U of M alumni community. And throughout the year, we take this alumni voice and their stories to our legislative leaders to support the university's legislative agenda. This year, UMAA's Minnesota 201 Legislative Alumni Network has expanded to 152 members in 75 House districts and 53 Senate districts. 170 high-quality contacts have been made between alumni and their legislators. And on April 30th, the MinPost published an op-ed in support of the university's budget request from UMAA Board Chair Mark Jessen. And I'd like to note that all of this takes a fair amount of resources, and the UMAA funds the vast majority of its work through its own financial efforts, which we expanded this year by growing revenue with new entrepreneurial activities. This conserves resources up to the, up for the university's academic mission. 
Our revenue generating efforts range from alumni association memberships and donations, growing sponsorships and corporate partnerships to the continued growth of the Minnesota alumni market. The UMAA continues to innovate with an entrepreneurial spirit, responding to the needs of the alumni and supporting the university's strategic plan. In fact, one of our major efforts this year has been responding to the university's request to change our current M mark, which we've had for over 40 years, to the university's iconic M mark. UMAA past chairs Dave Mona and Laura Moret co-chaired our intellectual property task force, which considered the request and the potential revenue opportunities that may come from this alignment. Two weeks ago, the UMAA board of directors voted to change to the university's mark and sunset our current mark, pending agreement of revisions to our MOU with the university. This move positions the UMAA to maintain our independent alumni voice, continue our entrepreneurial spirit, and capitalize on the university's recognized brand. Next slide, please. As we look ahead to the fiscal year, the Alumni Association will continue to listen to alumni and provide information, services, and resources that bring everyone together. Our efforts will include a balanced blend of both in-person and digital offerings so that alumni anywhere on the earth can take advantage of them while maintaining a strong sense of local community. We also look forward to welcoming alumni back to our extremely popular Minnesota Alumni Travel Program as travel uh, restrictions start to ease. We will continue our entrepreneurial and career efforts, creating new sources of revenue and growing existing sources that will enable us to keep pace with the needs of the alumni community. Above all, we will continue to seek opportunities to join with campus partners to make the U of M alumni experience as rich and rewarding as this incredibly important community deserves. And I'd like to close with a public thank you to our board chair, Mark Chesson, who led us under incredibly different, difficult circumstances this year. He did so with dedication, thoughtful leadership, humor, and grace. He was there every time we needed him, and we needed him a lot this year. We are incredibly fortunate to have talented and loyal alumni like Mark, who ensure that this university continues to, spro to prosper for future generations of students and alumni like his kids, Kelly, Henry, and Luke. Chair Powell, this con concludes our report, and we're happy to answer any questions or hear any feedback that you have. All right, well, very good. Well, first of all, Mark, thank you for your leadership in this year that, like all of us, you spent looking at a small screen, and, <laughs> and we're very, very grateful to you for your, for your service and all the great progress uh, that you made in spite of the pandemic this year. Thank you very, very much. We really are grateful to you for your service. And Lisa, we're so glad to see you in person and to see you so well on the way to recovery, you know, uh, after the, 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 your, your accident. The, um, we know that you're not 100%, but you, you're looking like you're pretty close. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it's, it's just it's great to see both of you, and we really um, are so grateful for everything that you do and for your service. Before I open it up um, to the board for comments and questions, I, I know President Gable wants to make a few remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll add my thanks to Lisa and her team, the UMAA board, Scott, Ann, Pat, and Lauren. Of course, special thanks to Mark for his strong leadership over the last year. I also want to extend my sincere appreciation to the entire network of alumni and supporters that you all steward and facilitate and channel and give a home to. They are our friends and our ambassadors, and they're the reason that we are able to do what we do. And it's very inspiring to see this community pull together in the way that you make happen that's so joyful and also impactful and has been so meaningful all the time, but especially in this last year, it's hard to imagine a more supportive group during a more challenging time. Um, you are incredible partners in the development of the strategic plan. We've been incredible partners in the development of the mark and all the other ways in which the Alumni Association tells its story on behalf of all of the alums. And you've been incredible advocates in, St in St. Paul in support of the budget and other recommendations. You've been incredible philanthropists. You've been incredible entrepreneurs. And there are countless other ways that you give back to our family, including reaching out to and supporting students through the emergency fund and those in need and those who may be in a job search, especially now. So we're poised for a really great year and a really great future because of your countless acts of service, and we want to express our gratitude for all of that work. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to you. 
Thanks. Thanks, President Cable. Um, Regents, questions, comments? Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell, and I won't uh, pile on with uh, President Gable and Chair Powell's remarks, but great to see both of you in front of us here, and Lisa, I know it's been a long year for you, too, so wonderful to have you here and uh, echo all those uh, great thoughts. As I look at the, uh, what is it, slide 87 with the uh, 3.4 million of uh, your support, and I think about the resources you need most, people and the time they bring to the table to help you deliver what you do, and dollars to help uh, deliver what you do. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back over past reports, and I'm happy to see you know, one slide with some very big pillars around which you are building that revenue model, and instead of a long laundry list of everything from you know license plates to uh, who knows, you've been creative over the years. Uh, here's my question. Am I, read, am I thinking about that right, that you're narrowing your focus on a handful of uh, places you, you look to and count on for revenue? Are there any in that list you'd want to hold up for us? I mean, how should I be thinking about how this institution and, on, and this board can make sure you've got the resources of time, talent, and money going forward? I, yeah, I'm glad you didn't have a lot of detail in here, but I'm just probing one level below that to see if you've got anything you know, else you want to share. And then I guess most specifically on that list, I hope that uh, the transition from TCF to Huntington works well for you because I know that's one of those elements of that financial support model. Chair Powell and uh, Regent McMillan, uh, thanks for asking that question. Uh, we are trying to be entrepreneurial and creative, but to think big, um, so to go bigger on fewer things, rather than to try to be all things to all people. And so I, I'm glad you kind of uh, teased that out in there. Um, I think I mentioned at a previous report that uh, we've been kicking around the idea of alumni housing and whether that might be something for the future, um, looking at, uh, we know that East Gateway District, uh, you know, may be um, an excite have an exciting future, and bringing alumni literally closer to the campus to be part of the intellectual life of the institution could be really exciting. So we're in early stage discussions and thinking about that and looking at whether there is a viable market for that as one idea. We've talked about the market, um, and then I mentioned the mark and the university's mark, and you mentioned the transition from TCF to Huntington. Um, we hope that there will be opportunities for the university to come together with the Alumni Association to think about bigger corporate deals and to think about those relationships. Um, we've looked at some of our peers who have done this as part of that Marks conversation. And they've, um, by working together collaboratively across the, a, a dispersed um, institution, they've actually been able to um, have everybody win just a little bit more. So it takes a little collaboration, it takes a little negotiation, but what we've heard from our peers is it's worth it. And so that's something I think this institution could look towards um, as we unify around the mark. Thank you. All right, Regent Farnsworth. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell, and um, good morning. It's great to have you here. Um, one quick comment and then two questions. Um, I really love the face masks. They were my favorite that I had throughout the whole pandemic, so they're very comfortable. Uh, two questions. One uh, about your position within the institution and one about uh, your work with Minnesota 201 and government relations. So uh, I, I picked up on something I think you had said, President Lewis, around your um, you know, make, wanting to maintain the independent voice of alumni mm -hmm. versus your, you know, relationship uh, with the institution, which of course you kind of have to hold both um, at the same time. So I'm curious when there's an issue, there's probably many examples I could use, but when there's an issue that's really, that alumni are really passionate about, whether it has to do with athletics or the building renamings, or I know there was, you know, there's, there's particular uh, in matters of institutional policy that alumni are particularly interested in. How do you kind of balance those two things when it comes to uh, a, a matter of institutional policy that um, alumni are passionate about, but also wanting to, to balance uh, the Alumni Association's position within the institution and wanting to advance um, the voices of alumni? And then my second question is about government relations and the relationship between the work that Minnesota 201 is doing and our uh, university government relations team. And just as a new region, I'm trying to kind of figure out all the different areas we plug into government relations and how um, everyone works collaboratively together. Thank you. Okay. 
Oh, sure. Um, uh, well, do you, want, you go. You, you take the first one. I'll take the second. Okay. One. Okay. Um, Chair Powell, Regent Farsworth, um, thank you for your question. Um, the uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, help me again. Just just concisely your first question. Yeah, and I'm sure I wasn't very concise, so my apologies. Trying to understand the uh, alumni association's role as wanting to advance the independent voice of alumni while also um, you know, maintaining um, your official um, connection or standing you know, with, with the institution. Right. And let's say there's a particular issue that of institutional policy that alumni are really passionate about. Right. Um, how do you kind of hold both of those um, truths when it comes to dealing with institutional policy making? Thank you, Regent Fardsworth. Um, it's always a challenge. Uh, recently, we've, you know, this has been a year with a lot of uh, issues that have come up that we have no history with, that the university has no history with, and all of a sudden we're dealing with social unrest, we're dealing with uh, budget deficits across the university, and we're dealing with um, the repercussions of that, including you know, the elimination of sports and so forth. You know, so there, when these things happen, we do the best we can to, number one, listen to the alumni, um, our team, our staff, Lisa and her team are very good at they and they read them all. They read all the emails. They read all of the questions and the complaints and the concerns. We oftentimes are the sounding board for all alumni when something happens at the university. And um, as the example with sports, uh, that's the, the front page usually for, for the entire state. That's the doorstep is the athletics program, and then we we hear about it at the university. So it's tricky sometimes because many of the decisions that are, are being made uh, by the board or by the administration or by the institution itself, um, we we aren't part of that, and it's just out of necessity. You can't have all the parts of the university involved as the, these decisions are being made and then as people are reacting to things as, like pandemics and so forth. And so this last year we heard from our alumni on many different topics. So we listen to them, we, we take their feedback, then we turn around and we try to go to those different parts of the university and get uh, their rationale get there uh, as much information that we can then turn around and share that with our alum. So it's, it's and as you will find out more as you get deeper into your career here, um, you hear from all over the state and you hear from all over the country, we hear from all over the world when these things happen. People love the institution and they care about it greatly. And so then we have to do the best we can to hear them and then find out is there a way we can as alumni be involved in that process. And we have reached out to the regents uh, with that, with the administration to offer our services because we always think that anytime you include alumni in those decision-making processes, that hopefully we can help get the best resolution possible because we were included in the conversation. Regent yeah. Farmer a follow up or a second question? Yeah, no, no follow up. Second question is good. So, to the question of the Minnesota 201, it's the Alumni Association's Legislative Advocacy Network, and we are storytellers. And we work very closely with government relations. Um, our staff member who is um, on our staff goes to their weekly meetings. We um, are the university's legislative agenda that's set by the Board of Regents is our legislative agenda. We don't have a separate agenda from the institution. And our job is to make sure that when those legislators are making decisions, they understand that they have a constituency of alumni who care about the university and who want them to support the university. So my goal would be that when, Reg when President Gable is walking, um, is talking to a legislator, that the thought bubble in that mind is their alumni constituents that they know and that they know care about the institution. So we want to make sure that every legislator understands the importance of the University of Minnesota Minnesota to the state and to their constituents. And then when we do that, then we let the university, the experts, uh, the government relations people actually do the discussions on this is what the institution needs, this is why. 
Uh, we don't try to explain every issue to every alum. That would be impossible. But they tell their stories extremely well, and their stories are powerful. So ours is about the relationship, and it's in partnership with the university that, who talks about the specific need at that moment. And that's how that works, if that explains. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell. All right. Thank you, Regent Farnsworth. Uh, Regent Mayron. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations and another outstanding year uh, under the most difficult of times. Um, I think back um, when I was on the board and president of the UMAA back in the 90s, and to see how far the association has come is just thrilling, uh, both in terms of breadth and depth and substance. It's, um, it's remarkable. So congratulations to you and to your members and all who work with you. Um, second, I wanted to say I'm thrilled to hear that you have worked out an arrangement with the university to address the M and the brand. And I think what I'm hearing is that you see it as an opportunity uh, going forward. And, and I, I think that's great um, and long overdue. And, and lastly, I think I have now understand the recipe to get uh, alums uh, engaged. And that was based on the story that Mark told, because it's my same story. My parents gave me the option of going to the university, or the university, or the university, mm -hmm. or I could take the money that would, they were going to give me to go to the university mm -hmm. and go to the university, meaning I had no choice, <laughs> and I love this institution, and here I am. So I think we've got the perfect recipe. Children <laughs> just need to listen to their parents, right? Okay. <laughs> In so many different ways, right? Exactly, exactly. All right, uh, thank you, Regent Mayor Ron. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Powell and Lisa and Mark. Um, I echo what's been said, and I appreciate how you uh, provide many opportunities to support the university, whether someone's an alum or not. I want to give a shout out to the alumni market, and uh, that's my go-to gift shop now, so if you haven't been there, people should go there. But could you quickly, um, what's the process as we talk with alums out in the state? If they're an entrepreneur, uh, I imagine there's a vetting process and such. Is there just a short three-step way that works that you could outline? Thank you. Uh, Regent Powell and Regent Davenport, thank you for the question. And um, thank you for your shopping at the market and supporting our alumni. Um, Yes, we, there is a vetting process uh, that we have a staff member who does that, um, who looks at the relation, looks at the um, at what the product is and is it a good fit for the market. And so, what they need, the, what the alum would need to do is to contact our office, and we would connect them with that person. But at a high level, we want to make sure that it's vi it's a viable product. Um, there's you know some insurance and things they have to have. To, you know, it has to be a vital, a going concern. They have to be able to supply it. You know, so if, if you order something, you have to be able to get it. So it has to be readily supplied. Um, so those are the two big things. And then it has to be something that like, can be shipped because we, we, that's how the market works. It's all digital. There is no in-person. So there are, there are a couple of pieces that we're looking at. We're also looking at future growth and potentially um, services down the road. Um, and uh, we've, that's been a life, that's been a dream for us. And so we're thinking about that. And so maybe I'll be back here next year with a report on services. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Regent Davenport. Uh, Regent Swigum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mark, uh, as an institution, we always got to be willing to change. Uh, as an institution, we always got to be willing to perform, get better, uh, be more accountable. What, uh, one or two things do we need to do from your perspective as an institution to make sure that Jess and grandchildren come to the university in 20 years? Uh, Chair Powell, Regent Swigum, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, well, we have to work on Regent Myron's plan to force the, I'll talk to my kids about making sure that they tell their kids they don't have any options. That'll be number one. Um, <laughs> The, I guess for me lately, what I've been dealing with as a parent with students on campus right now uh, is, is, is safety is an issue that um, obviously is, is right, right there. And uh, I was hearing from my son quite a bit over the course of the year with, with that concern. And so um, I was very excited 
to hear about President Gable's steps that she had taken um, in terms of safety around campus, particularly the Dinky Town area where the kids go to hang out and frequent the restaurants and the bars. So I was very excited to hear about the collaboration with the Minneapolis Police Department and the stepping up of the UMPD uh, in that regard. And so uh, for me, that's, if that's, that's critical for our institution to ensure that uh, all parents are excited about their children attending the University of Minnesota to take, to take advantage of, of the education that they can receive here. And so we want, we want this community to not only uh, create uh, our leaders for tomorrow, but keep them safe in the process. Uh, for me, that's, that's uh, been foremost on my mind. Thanks, Mark. F follow up, Regent Sweden? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Hibsch. Uh, thanks, Chair Powell. Um, I just want to say, uh, to answer uh, Regent Swigum's question, if we had 608,000 Mark Jessens, we wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> he's one of the most generous and uh, unselfish people that I've ever met, and he's uh, always got the you in mind in everything he does and says. So thank you for that. You were a great advocate for our university. and. Uh, Secondly, I just want to thank Lisa and her staff. Lisa's had a tremendously tough year with her un unreal accident that happened, but she's looking good. And uh, but mm -hmm. uh, when she came here seven or eight years ago, she basically had to pivot the whole organization because we didn't have the funds we needed. And she streamlined the whole organization. She brought in uh, uh, people where we were lacking, and she just uh, she did a wonderful job of of uh, made being entrepreneurial and uh, kind of making a standalone organization. So thank you for that. No con no questions, just comments, so. All right, Th thank you, Regent Hibsch. Uh, Regent Roche. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll be very, very brief. Thank you for the report and thank you for all that you do. Um, you know, people that lead this organization from the alumni side are obviously critical. We have at least one person on, at this, on this board that has played that role. Um, you know, as, as the, the, these are, I think, very good questions, and it's a good dialogue. Um, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that there are so many institutions that have completely different models for how the alumni interacts. There are institutions within our conference where the alumni pick a significant number of trustees. Um, that's a, a pretty strong input uh, opportunity, I think. Um, and then there are also challenges, such as you know, I mean, one of the questions that that. Uh, Regent Farnsworth uh, brought up about how do you incorporate that voice but yet still maintain the university's control of the agenda because the farther you get the more you get individual perspectives that start to come in and under the under the rubric of the university. Um, what I'm uh, struck by and, and Mr. Chair at some point um, maybe we can uh, engage this a bit as a board but it seems like when you, you're talking about the housing issue and I'm, I'm looking at this you know, there, there's an element of the Alumni Association that would like to look at alumni housing, but yet at the same time, we have a critical need for student housing and safe student housing. And how do we find that balance uh, with the very few resources we have around here from a physical standpoint? Um, but it seems to me that uh, while I always look forward to these annual reports, there may be other opportunities throughout the course of the year on major issues where I think the Alumni Association could help us divine the perspective of alumni um, and help us get that kind of support. Um, so it isn't just a, well, here we are in July, so let's have this conversation, but something that can continue on. And then maybe, you know, that would then let this discussion focus a bit more on operations and budget and those kinds of things that I think are really critical. So, um, Mr. Chair, I just hope that we as a board, whether it's in a, a retreat setting or whether it's in, a, in, in board meetings, um, find ways of, of improving that engagement and, and increasing the understanding on both sides of what the relationship is. So, but thank you for all you do. All right, thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. Um, I, have a, I have a quick question maybe for both of you. And it just, you know, as we think about the last year and um, um, leaving aside, uh, Lisa, a tree falling on you, what was, <laughs> What, what, what was your biggest, what's the, what are the biggest surprises, if you will, to come out of just the way your organization worked, what it learned? I mean, it, it was challenging for all of us, but I bet you there are some things that, that were surprising and we will be repeated um, that we had to adapt. I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that. Chair sure, Paul, thanks for the question. I, uh, there's a lot, there was a lot that, you know, this city 
um, went through a lot this last year. And so um, it was uh, surprising to see, uh, to watch uh, the administration um, pivot and handle these things as they came along. I watched it from uh, the perspective of a parent of a student on campus, and um, the, I couldn't even imagine uh, being in that, that spot and trying to figure out how do we navigate through this thing? How do we educate the kids, the students, uh, under these circumstances? And so to watch that happen was um, truly inspiring. Uh, it, I missed all the things that we do here on campus. There are so many traditions that we have on an annual basis that we that I always just took for granted. Of course, I go down to homecoming, you know, and, you know, and we couldn't do that. And so um, I, I was impressed with the way the UMAA team uh, was able to still uh, have events although it was virtual and everyone was forced into that situation. Everyone had to, that's how we got our events. So I was impressed with the UMAA team and how they, they were able to try to give us as much as they could under the circumstances. Um, the thing I was uh, very proud of was, what our, was our board. Uh, the uh, board of directors for the Alumni Association uh, moved the ball this year on so many different fronts, whether it was the marks, whether it was alumni housing, what we were able to do moving the ball forward with um, supporting alumni entrepreneurs with the market. We, we kept things, we didn't, we didn't wade, we didn't uh, just uh, wait for things to, to, to get better. We, we worked on things. So I was very um, pleased with, with our board and the work that they were able to do during this year. That's great, thank you. Lisa. And, and I would add, I think, two words. One is pride. I've been in higher ed for over 30 years, and I've never been more proud to be in higher ed than I was this year. And watching what a major research institution does during a global pandemic and the impact that this institution had, I was just extremely proud of to be part of this community. I was proud of our board, I was proud of our staff, extremely proud of President Gable's leadership and how she just stepped up and communicated again and again and again. Um, it, was a, it was a great moment of um, affirmation of the work that I've spent my life doing. Uh, so, that, so that was one. The other is gratitude, and that, that you've mentioned my accident. For those who don't know, a tree fell on me, and I broke both arms and, and a leg and spent this year recovering in the midst of all of this. And um, I just could not be more grateful. And I, I want to uh, especially note President Gable. She texted my husband almost every day for the first couple of weeks. Uh, to see how I was and just was unbelievable. She's running this major institution in the middle of a pandemic and just was so human and empathetic as a leader um, and a human being that I just, it, it's amazing. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to her, to our board and um, what, they, what they did, what Mark did um, for me and to our staff. Um, it's, Tuesday will be a year since the accident. And um, I'm really, really grateful to be part of this university community because they stepped up big time for me and supported me during a really difficult time. So pride and gratitude are my two words this year. All right, well, those are good words. And I, I don't think uh, there's, there's no doubt that, that this university and this board is very grateful to both of you for your service. And it's uh, everything you've done during a very tough year. And as you said, uh, Mark, we kept, we kept moving the ball, and you clearly did. And uh, it's just, so it's great, it's great to have you here this morning and to hear all the progress and, to, and, and the, your anticipation and all the good things that we know are going to happen. It's really inspiring. So, so uh, thank, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, if I could interrupt, I, I'm sorry for the interruption, but I'd, I'd like to have one more alumni voice be able to uh, talk about uh, the university, if that would be an uh, appropriate time. It would take just 10 minutes. I think that you would find it very enlightening. Yeah, I, I prefer not to do that uh, with all due respect. And it was great to meet you and uh, other members who of your family and the group who are with you. But um, we have a very, very, very packed agenda this morning. And so I, I really want to continue to work my way through that. There will be, we, we encourage you to 
reach out to the board's office and uh, the, 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 and we'll try at the September meeting. But of all the meetings of the year, this one is really jam packed. And uh, I prefer not to do that. So with great respect uh, for you uh, and for uh, all the people who are with you, uh, I'm going to decline that request. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, our next item, uh, which is the fourth and final conversation in a series with leaders from system campuses. And to lead us in that discussion, we have Mary holtz Claus, Acting Executive Chancellor for the Morris and Crookston campuses, and Janet Schrunk Erickson, Acting Chancellor for the Morris campus. It's great to see both of you today in person. Thank you for making the trip here. And before we turn it over to you, President Gable, uh, would you like to introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sigmund, and members of the board. Um, with the board's approval of the metrics and measures for impact 2025 at the February meeting, the university system is in full swing implementing the plan. So Morris is the fourth of the campuses to present how their strategy aligns with impact 2025 following Rochester, Crookston and Duluth's presentations at the March, May and June meetings respectively. Members of the board, one of the distinct benefits and designs of Impact 2025 is having a system plan around which our entire university can coalesce, but that also ensures the unique and special identities of each campus, as well as the strategies that meet the needs of their respective communities. And our Morris campus exemplifies this school of thought. With sincere appreciation for Michelle Bear's strong leadership and commitment to the University of Minnesota Morris, we now welcome Janet Erickson in her new role as Acting Chancellor of the Morris Campus. Given her long tenure at UMN Morris, Janet has a deep understanding and appreciation for the unique role that Morris plays in the university system. She demonstrates a strong commitment to collaboration and consultation and values the impact that shared governance has on fulfilling the mission. I have full confidence in Janet's leadership and look forward to working with her in her new role over the next two years. Also, my thanks to Mary Holtzclaus, Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Crookston and Acting Executive Chancellor for Crookston and Morris, who make a dream team working together over these several weeks and into the next two years to plan for how to best collaborate for the benefit of the campus and the university system as a whole. And I want to extend my sincere thanks to the entire Morris community for their really important engagement advocacy, insights, student focus, and incredible community impact through the strategic planning process and in their own right. This began with my inauguration visit in fall of 2019, which seems like 100 years ago, mm -hmm. and a campus town hall about the plan and continued in the face of the broad challenges we've experienced over the last year, a leadership transition, and remained steadfast through the most recent metrics and measure space. Through Morris's effort and in so many other ways, Impact 2025 exemplifies that we're five campuses strong, but working together as one to ensure that our best days lie ahead. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Acting Chancellor Janet Erickson and Acting Executive Chancellor Mary Holtzclaus to continue the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Acting Chancellor, Acting Executive Chancellor, over to you. Chair Powell, members of the Board of Regents, and President Gable, good morning, and thank you for that introduction. And thank you for this opportunity to share an overview of the University of Minnesota Morris strategic vision and plan and its intersections with the University of Minnesota Impact 2025 commitments. Our plans are united and advanced by shared commitments and elevate our place as one of the University of Minnesota's five distinct campuses. The Morris Driven Capital Campaign frames UMN Morris, this residential public liberal arts college, as a model for living and learning. Today, I will outline some of the ways in which we have brought this clear vision established in our founding in 1960 to life for 2021 and for a vibrant future. As President Gable's own undergraduate experience makes clear, a rigorous liberal arts college education provides an education that equips graduates with the skills and understanding to lead with flexibility and integrity for the future in and beyond careers. As the University of Minnesota's liberal arts campus, Morris gains from and adds to the strength of the University of Minnesota and our shared Impact 2025 commitments. Crafted in a multi-step, broadly consultative process with faculty, staff, students, alumni, and community partners, our current strategic plan elevates UMN Morris's place as a vibrant center for education, engaged with the region, state, nation, and world. Our planning began in the fall of 2017 under former Chancellor Baer's leadership. 
Faculty, staff, and students came together in stage one for six readings and conversations to look outside ourselves to the current, and insofar as we could envision them, future, realities of American higher education. In spring 2018, using these readings and community conversations as context, and our mission, history, and culture as bedrock, the second stage of our strategic visioning and planning gathered input from over 170 campus community members to craft a set of forward-looking and forward-thinking goals to define Morris's aspirations for the next decade. Our campus assembly's faculty, staff, and student members endorsed this strategic vision you see on this slide in November 2018. The vision affirms and strengthens UMN Morris's national leadership in collaborative and innovative 21st century liberal arts education, honors our history and place, outlines key components of our rigorous academic programs, and affirms our commitment to a diverse community that inspires and equips students to connect their passions to meaningful futures. That same fall, four task forces representing governance committees and all campus constituencies developed potential strategies and tactics to address essential aspirations and recommended priorities, timelines, and key stakeholders for consideration. This was phase three of the planning process. The consultative iterative process included, as you can tell, many campus conversations, community forums, and surveys. From hundreds of great ideas, hundreds, literally, the campus identified 10 key priorities endorsed by the campus assembly in spring 2019. The process was then repeated in fall 2019 with the four remaining aspirational statements and eight key priorities were endorsed by Campus Assembly in the spring of 2020 with 96% approval. Our strategic work is centered in these four commitments. Public liberal arts for the future, that is building the model 21st century public liberal arts college, excellence for everyone, fostering capacity with respect to community, culture, climate, and governance, Vital campus community, ensuring a, a sustainable and stable university community, and engaging with the region, state, and beyond. Morris as a leader and partner for tomorrow. The aspirations and the priorities connected to these commitments are included in the plan summary linked to at the beginning of our docket materials. While the Morris strategic plan preceded Impact 2025, the two are, and the two are aligned on different axes, one for a complex, multifaceted university system and one for a focused campus with a singular mission, the plans have much in common. We are clearly one University of Minnesota, operating with shared commitments and priorities. This slide highlights the overlap between the Morris and Impact 2025 strategic plans. As you can see, the five commitments of Impact 2025 lead Morris forward with strongest alignment in our shared commitments to excellence for everyone. The Morris campus is now in phase four of our process, bringing our strategic vision and plan to life as we advance UMN Morris's distinct mission within the University of Minnesota. We began our implementation in fall 2019, focusing on the first 10 key priorities. The full vision and plan have already informed budget decisions, administrative unit reorganizations, and detailed strategic action planning. This visual brings together the range of that big work. Uh, don't worry, we don't really expect you to read this slide. <laughs> um, to give you a sense of how much we already have done, I would like to highlight three areas of progress to date, and more are in the docket. The first is our strategic restructuring of administrative support and academic units that will help us continue to be a vital campus community while addressing priority areas and realizing cost savings. Changes yielded a net decrease of over 20 full-time equivalent staff positions and a budget savings of 1.5 million in 2021 going into fiscal year 2022. We created such things as the Student Success Center, which you're, you'll hear more about in a minute. Achieving excellence for everyone is supported by our recent comprehensive indigenized assessment and planning process focused on increasing Native American students' educational attainment. The full report, titled Native American Student Educational Equity and Post-Secondary Attainment, Assessment of Progress and Action Steps for 2020 to 2030, is linked to on page 92 of the docket materials. The assessment informed two projects bolstering Native American student success and building pathways for tribal college graduates to earn BAs at UMN Morris. 
The projects launched in October of 2020 with support from the US Department of Education Title III Native American Serving Non-Tribal Institutions Program in the form of two five-year awards, 3.4 million in total. And third, our model for living and learning focus within the UMN Driven Capital Campaign exceeded 31.6 million, 151% of our campaign goal, providing external support for priorities within each of the UMN Morris strategic commitments. UMN Morris embraces our part in the University of Minnesota family and the alignment of our work with Impact 2025. Doing so frames our distinctive campus identity, which our campus-specific strategic plan further elevates. Our commitment to being the model 21st century public liberal arts college rests on our strong values of intellectual curiosity, inclusion, and respect, and builds on our place and connections within the university in the state of Minnesota. It also draws on and amplifies our leadership within uh, uh, the university as one of the nation's top 10 public liberal arts colleges. We celebrate our success in multicultural and international diversity as part of our commitment to excellence for everyone. And UMN Morris is the only four-year federally designated Native American serving non-tribal institution in the upper Midwest, um, and only one of 20 across the United States institutions where Native students comprise at least 10% of undergraduates. We also deeply value our location in West Central Minnesota and our extensive regional connections. Our deep roots in our place on the prairie inform our strategic commitments. Morris students enjoy close interactions with faculty, staff, and with their peers. This collegial environment is central to students' development of critical thinking skills and their ability to work in groups. Two of the most highly sought after skills identified in a recent survey of about 500 employers and areas where more students excel. Clearer articulation of the ways our graduates are career ready will be essential as we position Morris as a public liberal arts college for the future and inspire and equip our students to envision the ways they will connect their passions to meaningful futures. The Morris strategic commitments amplify multiple ways our in innovative leadership in sustainability. Morris is already a nationally and internationally recognized model for living and learning sustainably. We are, for instance, identified as a gold star campus by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. UMN Morris also generates the most electricity on site per student of any campus in the United States, according to Environment America. New and continuing partnerships with the UMN West Central Research and Outreach Center, the City of Morris, Stevens County, USDA Soils Lab, Stevens Community Medical Center, Morris Area School District, area citizens, and others propel us forward in identifying and meeting shared goals in clean, efficient energy, transportation, waste reduction, and recycling, and education. These partnerships demonstrate community-scaled, world-changing solutions to address climate change and showcase and advance the Morris campus's award-winning leadership in sustainability and conservation. Our strategic commitment to engagement extends well beyond the region. The University of Minnesota Morris is a core partner with the UMN Institute on the Environment in the Climate Smart Municipalities Initiative, pairing Minnesota green communities with partner cities in Germany. A technical partnership between Morris, Minnesota and Zarbeck, Germany has inspired transformative learning for students and campus and community leaders to advance our shared climate leadership goals. The Morris campus commitment to student engagement and to partnerships for tomorrow intersects well with each of our strategic commitments. The Clifford J. Benson Center for Community Partnerships team places students in local internships, community collaborations, engaged learning projects and faculty student research projects addressing sustainability and other community needs. Interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary work characterize the Morris academic experience, as does undergraduate research. Half of all Morris students participate in faculty-mentored research beyond their coursework. And in two of the last four years, Morris has been identified by the federal government as a Fulbright US student program top producing baccalaureate institution, a highly unusual designation for a public institution. 
Our model for the future of public liberal arts education draws on research by the American Association of Colleges and Universities and others that indicates that student learning is deepened and student success is heightened by well-developed active learning and engagement practices. More students participate in these transformational high impact practices at rates well above students at other public liberal arts colleges and at universities overall. This is fundamental to our campus identity, our strategic vision, and our alignment with Impact 2025, particularly the commitments to student success, discovery, innovation, and impact, as well as community and belonging. National survey of student engagement data show that 96% of Morris seniors participated in two or more high impact practices prior to their graduation. The table on the slide compares the percentage of Morris seniors engaging in an activity prior to graduation compared to their Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges, that's the COPLAC column, peers, as well as to students at the 600 four-year universities participating in the survey, that's the Nessie All column. The Carnegie National Baccalaureate Arts and Sciences Colleges group, that's the one on the right, the BAC-AS, of which Morris is a part, consists of nearly 90% private colleges led by Williams College, Amherst College, Bowdoin College, all of which are better, well are better resourced and serve more traditionally college-bound student populations with higher expectations for student engagement. UMN Morris's recognition as a Carnegie community-engaged campus, an impact 2025 goal for all UMN campuses, reflects our long-time continuing commitment to engaged learning for all students. While personalized attention from faculty and staff, an abundance of student leadership opportunities, and an education of breadth, depth, and flexibility characterize liberal arts colleges, UMN Morris brings these experiences to one of the most diverse student populations in Minnesota higher education. A student body including far more first-generation college goers and students from low-income backgrounds than at our private college peers. In fall 2020, Minnesota residents comprised three quarters of the Morris campus student body 79 of the state's 87 counties represented on campus. Students from greater Minnesota comprised 46% of Morris students, the highest in the UMN system, while about a third of our students come from the Twin Cities metro area. The remaining 25% of students hailed from 34 uh, states and 17 countries. UMN Morris proudly enrolls many students from groups traditionally underserved by higher education. In fall of 2020, 28% of our first new first year students were Pell recipients, 34% were first generation, and 42% identified as American Indian, Hispanic, Asian, or African American. In total, 70 tribal nations, Alaska Native villages, and First Nations are represented on campus. Our strategic vision and plan prioritize enhanced recruitment of local students from historically underserved backgrounds. An assistant director of multicultural recruitment joining the Morris community this summer will focus on further diversifying the student population, building relationships with local community groups, and advancing our commitment to excellence for everyone. We are also expanding access and support for transfer students with a new transfer student services program launched to coordinate new student pathways, ongoing partnerships, and greater transfer student matriculation, engagement, and success. UMN Morris, like so many other campuses, is also committed to regaining momentum in international student enrollment. The campus's right size of 1,700 students will be achieved by increased new student enrollment coupled with increased student retention. The 1700 enrollment, student enrollment goal is realistic. It is one that the campus can both achieve and maintain. We recognize that stabilizing enrollment is essential to future success. New high school student enrollment for fall 2021 continues to trend higher than last year. Deposits were up by about 8% as of June 28th. New transfer students deposits for domestic students remain similar to last year but the admit rate for new high school students entering fall 2021 is higher, 74%, compared to fall 2020, 61%, as is the campus yield rate. 
with a new director of admissions, new admissions counselors, and a now seasoned leadership in enrollment management, implementing our well-crafted strategic enrollment plan, Morris is on a strong path in enrollment. A top strategic priority aligned with our commitment to a vital campus community centers on the campus's first strategic enrollment management plan. Completed in the fall of 2020, the plan was informed by a campus-wide process and an in-depth retention analysis led by external experts from ACRO Consulting. The plan also builds upon goals and strategies outlined in our five-year enrollment plan as reported to the Board of Regents in March of 2019, as well as on our strategic commitments. Strategies in progress include, as you can see here, developing and implementing a strategic recruitment plan to identify, recruit, and enroll a diverse and a sustainable student population. To this end, we have enhanced recruitment efforts using a multi-channel behavior responsive outreach. We have implemented a new user-friendly net price calculator to assist families in understanding affordability and cost. We've launched the search for the Assistant Director of Multicultural Recruitment in the Office of Admissions. We have enhanced digital marketing and remarketing to reach a broader population of students, and more as outlined in the docket. The second strategic enrollment management goal builds on our transfer student population, supported by our new transfer student services program, new relationships with tribal and community colleges, and clearer transfer pathways, work that is also supported by one of our Nasanti grants. We have developed and seek to expand our system collaborations. We'd welcome more system-wide marketing that expands visibility for UMN Morris as one of five great options for Minnesota students. And with, assistant, with assistance from UMN System and UMN Duluth University Relations colleagues, we are restructuring our communications and marketing efforts. An admissions collaboration between UMN Morris and UMN Crookston is cross-training our recruitment staff creating collaborative outreach events for pop target populations, such as transfer students, and providing staffing support as the Morris campus launches the Slate CRM tool this summer. Our strategic management goals operate within the campus and impact 2025 strategic commitments to student success, as you can see again in these three areas. Creation of our new first year experience course sequence, improved coordination of communication across campus offices, an expanded academic support resources team, and the creation of a new student success center will elevate student-centered support in the coming year and student success. Our work on clear pathways for students <laughs> to and through UMN Morris and beyond includes recent collaborations with the White Earth Tribal and Community College to meet their graduates' interests in pursuing a Morris BA in Human Services. Within the UMN system, we continue to work to develop additional pathways for Morris graduates to Minnesota graduate programs. We have a strong pathway to the School of Nursing's Master's in Nursing program, for instance, and Dean Jenkins and I hope to build a better path from Morris to the law school. More broadly, our campus student learning outcomes revised in 2020 better reflect the UMN Morris experience and articulate the benefits of a liberal arts college education to current and prospective students and their families. UMN Morris 21st century graduates are career ready, creative problem solvers, and community contributors. And there's a nice graphic on page 100 in your docket. While doing all of this, while creating and implementing our strategic plan, the Morris campus has also reduced administrative costs through strategic restructuring, local partnerships, and centralized support. Our strategic commitment to being a vital campus community is directly tied to both student success and fiscal stewardship, as defined in Impact 2025. UMN Morris has reduced 6.5 million in salaries and fringe over the last eight years through position reductions and internal reallocation from direct mission, mission support, and leadership and oversight bringing our salary and fringe budget to its current 28.3 million. We have eliminated more than 58 full-time equivalent positions since fiscal year 2018, over 20 in the last year, through retirements and departures. Simultaneous reduction, investment, and expanded external support for new initiatives has still allowed us to advance our strategic plan. 
Community collaborations provide enrichment experiences for more students while simultaneously lowering administrative costs, both for the campus and for local entities. The Regional Fitness Center, founded in 1999 and located on campus, operates as a joint powers entity with the Morris Area School District, City of Morris, and Stevens County. UMN Morris football and track facilities operate as joint use agreements with the Morris Area School District. More recent, most recently, this summer, the Morris Community Softball Complex was constructed on campus in a partnership with the Morris Area School District and the City of Morris, financed in large part by local private donors. Finally, we are looking forward to formally launching the Emerging Morris Challenge, funded by private giving, which seeks to meet the challenges of rural areas, elevate UMN Morris as a center for rural innovation, and strengthen further our local and regional partnerships. The Morris campus is forward thinking and fiscally responsible. We utilize cost pool supported central resources whenever possible and rely on system services such as the Center for Educational Innovations, Faculty Instructional Development and Resources, and the University of Minnesota Foundation's infrastructure and technical expertise to enhance our development efforts. UMN Morris functions more effectively and efficiently because of system synergies. Chair Powell, our final slide will be presented by my colleague, Acting Executive Chancellor Mary Holtz Claus. Chair Powell and members of the Regents, the pandemic has taught us how it's possible and important to share the perspectives of each of our distinctive campuses together, to think more creatively and to learn from one another, and how to share resources. Having everyone on Zoom, yes, this is some good comments I'm going to make about Zoom, for instance, actually increased opportunities for voices from all of our campuses to be heard directly while containing costs and generating operational efficiencies. It's also helped to build upon system-wide solutions that accommodate our campus differences. We hope to continue and to build upon the communication models that were developed by the pandemic necessity. The Morris campus has appreciated the opportunity to be a leader in enhancing system-wide student mental health capacity and infrastructure. The university's first system-wide marketing campaign, elevating the five distinctive UMN campuses, our missions and cultures to prospective students and college choice influencers is a terrific effort to raise understanding of and visibility of the university's power and possibility for undergraduates. And being part of the system-wide driven campaign was vital to Morris's ability to significantly exceed their campaign goals and positions the campus well for continued private giving growth. More collaboration along these lines are welcome. As our Chancellor UMN, uh, Chancellor Lori Carroll from Rochester summarized very well in her March 2021 strategic planning presentation, she said to you, Optimizing how we work as interdependent and a strong system can serve to advance cooperative efforts, find efficiencies, showcase extension and various research and engagement endeavors across the state, and provide a model for how the university system function and grow to stabilize enrollments on all of our campuses. Support for our systemness serves the good of the whole. The UMN strategic vision and plan, which Janet very, very well defined for us, explicitly recognizes the campus's individual strengths and contributions as part of the University of Minnesota system. Support of the MPAC 2025 commitments will support the University of Minnesota Morris. In tandem, support for the Morris strategic commitments will amplify UMN Morris's place as a center for education, engage with the region, state, nation, and world, and solidify our role within the University of Minnesota system so that we can strengthen and be strengthened by the system campuses. The last slide I was going to say we would welcome to entertain any of your questions. And we also have behind us, I was going to say, Vice Chancellor Sandra olson Loy and Vice Chancellor Brian Herman. So we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you for a very good presentation. And um, I know there are gonna be questions. I thought maybe I'll, maybe I'll jump the gun with the first one while the hands are going up and we're, we're getting a list here. Um, so this one's, I think, for you, um, Acting Chancellor Erickson. Um, this, simplistically, and so this, it may be I'm asking for sort of simple answers to complicated questions, but when you think about the profile 
of um, a potential UMM student and you know how what they're looking for and how they're thinking about higher ed. So I'm thinking of the high school senior who's on that college. So how you know what are the what are the headline um, requirements and interests that that person has that you know that's considering Morris? Is it and just as an example, I, I don't think I want to be in the big city, or I, I really am pretty sure I want to go to graduate school, and I, so I want to, so I'm just interested in maybe the two or three things that might um, characterize um, the potential student. And then the follow-on question is, how, and then how do we find those students from a marketing standpoint, and, and what are the messages that are most persuasive for that student? Chair Powell, thank you for the question. Um, the first part is easier than the second part. Um, the first part is that a Morris student is mostly interested in doing as well as thinking and learning. Uh, the two words that I use repeatedly to describe the Morris experience are opportunity, which I think exists across the university, but also access. We give students access in small classes, in one-on-one -on -one relationships, in leadership opportunities to the things that they might not otherwise, they would have to compete for in a larger institution. Students on the Morris campus are, as you saw, really engaged. So the student who wants to be a biochemistry major and an English major, or who wants to be a um, a data sciences minor with a uh, environmental studies major and be in the plays, can come to Morris. And those are the students who love Morris. Those are the students who continue to talk about Morris after they've completed because it has given them a lot more than simply one major. They have found ways to continue to be engaged citizens. Finding those students does, as our enrollment has shown, continue to be a challenge. I think getting students there what we is one path to success. One of the things that we discovered with the um, market research around the system campaign was that again and again, we don't want to be the best kept secret of the University of Minnesota, and yet we still are. Um, we need yeah. to get people to understand who we are, where we are, and r when people come to campus often, they've never been there before, they, they say, I didn't know there was so much here. Yes, there is much here. Um, so we are working on elevating that. But I, I do think the system campaign that says there are five of us, come out to Crookston, come out to Morris. Um, it, it, Duluth is a little more visible than we are. Um, it, that's, that is a key. Because they don't understand, I think, that small does not necessarily mean quiet. Small does not, definitely does not mean um, not full of options and opportunities. Thank you. It's very, very helpful. Um, uh, Regent Kenyon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, some of my comments, it's like you read my mind, but I haven't used this microphone in a while, so I'm going to reiterate some of those points. <laughs> um, but no, I, I'm, a, I'm a big Morris cheerleader. Um, uh, Maybe part of it's my recency bias, which I'm okay with, of having have been there recently for commencement. But um, just a few comments. You know, uh, you know, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, this is a great education and great experience. Some of the points you were talking about, um, you just said that students are interested in doing, you know, as well as thinking and learning, and that's highlighted. I think uh, this table on page 96. Um, Fifty percent of students worked on a research project with a faculty member. Forty-three studied abroad. I mean, that that's that's high, right? And and especially you pointed out the the peers you're being compared to are are you know private institutions, you know, with more resources and and, and things of that nature. So you know, this is really impressive. Excuse me, um, but I, I guess when we talk about I wholeheartedly agree about marketing and just telling the story and not being the best kept secret. I have, I've in the past, and still am, a, a proponent of, of um, some of the initiatives we've done around the system, such as share my app and things like that. Um, but I will admit, you know, that's not the end all be all answer. I think Provo, uh, Vice Provost McMaster would be happy to, to hear that because I think we always press share the apps, share the apps. but. Um, you know, in addition to that, I think whether or not a, a student goes to a campus is is probably more determined by who they are than what the campus is, right? And and there are students, 
you know, who want this. There are students who would would never even consider, you know, this institution. And, and you know, there are students who, if, if, they're, if they're applying to UM Twin Cities, if they're applying to uh, University of Minnesota Duluth, if they're not accepted, they're going to apply to the next institution with about 10,000 students or the next, you know, uh, flagship R1 institution. They're not, you know, necessarily. But those those students who want to go to Morris are there. And to your point, you know, it's a, a, a too well kept secret, right? And, and I know those marketing efforts are underway. Um, I also think, um, you know, campus like Morris and Crixton, um, um, get to the heart of our land grant mission in ways that I certainly didn't understand until uh, Brian drove me around and, and showed me all the things he was just talking about here uh, a couple months ago. So um, th that conversation that started between the chair um, and acting chancellor, uh, Shrunk Erickson, I, I, I wholeheartedly endorse. And um, I think um, I, we, we got to find those students. I don't know where they are, but uh, we got to find them. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Thank you. Yeah, comments or, yeah, Mary? Uh, just like uh, Regent Kenyanya, thank you very much for your comments. And Chair Powell, I think it's really important that as we continue the marketing, we've got a good beginning um, and we need to continue that piece. We also need to work very, very significantly on creating pathway programs because we need to start bringing our students in at a younger age and help them visualize that they can have a college education, help them understand how they can create that pathway and work with them, and then continue to bring them onto our campuses. So I have to say, as I was starting to look at the statistics, particularly particularly in Morris, I was struck by how many of Morris's students are from Minnesota. And we really need to continue to work on, on um, helping people be aware of, of those treasures and, that are out there. So thank you very much for your comments. Follow on? Yeah, brief follow up. Thank you. Um, unrelated question that um, you know, I just remembered. Um, you know, I know Morris is, is uh, very open and, and um, you know, about its history, right? And, and there's a lot of initiatives, um, obviously the tuition waiver, but m many other things, right? Um, in, in trying to uh, acknowledge and reconcile that. And at a system level, the president's certainly made that a priority. Um, what, I mean, going forward, what are some is initiatives we have to, to continue to, to um, you know, reckon with that? And then question that I'm not sure if it's for the chancellors or the president um, in terms of, that waiver, I know we've talked about um, getting federal support. I mean, we're totally on board for it, um, but I think um, there's maybe an opportunity there for federal support to make sure we continue and possibly expand that. Um, so some comments on that would be appreciated. Thank you, Chair Powell, Regent Kenyanya. You may come back and visit us anytime. <laughs> you were very popular with, with the, the students as well, so we're happy to have you favoring us. Right? Um, <clears throat> The, the two, we have, as you have seen, um, and as I shared with Regent Johnson and uh, others after the onboarding last week, we have uh, tried to communicate well um, with our, uh, all of our constituents, with all of those who are involved in uh, Morris's history and present. We are grateful to the members of our American Indian Advisory Committee for their guidance. With their support, we have worked to bring Dakota and Anishinaabe elders uh, to campus to bring healing and care in traditional ways for the children, families, and communities impacted by our boarding schools that operated on the lands uh, that are now home to our campus, as you know. We have also joined the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition and uh, are working with them, valuing their partnership and work in greater truth-telling, uh, understanding, and ultimately healing regarding this history and its continuing impacts in Indian country. They have identified more than uh, 15 church, uh, sorry, they have identified 15 federal and church-run boarding schools within Minnesota for context, and more than 350 schools across the country that operated during this time. So it's a large group that um, we can partner with and learn more from. On Morris campus, I, I, we also have a number of initiatives that directly address um, again, who we are and where we are, our history and our future. We work to provide an experience that values Native American people, cultures, and life ways. In a recent survey, uh, Native American students, of Morris Native American students, they agreed that people on campus treat each other respectfully. 85% of our students felt this. And that they felt valued as a person. 
uh, on the, at UMN Morris, 85%. And that faculty care about students at UMN Morris, 100% of Native students felt that. Native representation in our curriculum, uh, co-curriculum and in campus more generally is growing. We have a Native American and Indigenous Studies major and minor, which we've had for some time. We also offer Anishinaabe Moan and Dakota Lapi courses and language tables. We have a Native American student success program that offers success coaching, mentors, and cultural learning. We offer equity, diversity, and intercultural programs that support, uh, in all sorts of ways, indigenous students. <coughs> Student life has many nods to and inclusion of Native American traditions and uh, uh, pays attention to what we are doing going forward. Um, one of the things that I think is most exciting right now is our two grants that we have from the federal government, as I said. Uh, we have two five-year grants. One of them is focused on education and on bringing in more Native American students to become educators. We are working on creating a transferable curriculum, not transfers from one college to the other, but one a curriculum that any teacher can use in primary and secondary education that is more Native aware. And uh, that is in development. We are also, with the other grant, working on building better pathways, partnering with Minnesota tribal and community colleges to figure out what their students are interested in and how we can bring them to Morris, if that's what they're interested in doing, for a BA after they complete two years at a community college. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Very good, thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Powell, and thank you, Acting Chancellor. Shank Erickson and Chancellor Holzklaus for your presentation. I have um, two comments and a question. And first, the alum I've talked to for Morris all have a deep, deep appreciation for the education and the educational environment that they experienced. Second, I like the uh, connection and imagery of the star quilt mm -hmm. in your, um, it's a good vehicle to provide um, focus points on Native American attainment and your equity plan. But my question is, um, what percent of your students are full-time versus part-time? And I'm guessing they're mostly full-time. And are you using that as a strategy um, and with your success uh, program for retention, especially with uh, Native American students and diverse students? And is that working? Chair Powell, Regent Davenport, there's a statistic that I don't have at my fingertips, so I'm going to look around. 96? Thank you. 97? Uh, I, I was going to say almost all are full-time, um, um, and, and I know that is correct, but I wasn't sure of the exact number. Um, because of the kind of college we are, most of our students are traditionally aged 18 to 22, not all, and most of them are full-time uh, degree-seeking students. Um, uh, and the second part of your question? So that sounds like a strategy that is successful in retention. It, it is, and uh, we do reach out to students who have dis paused in their progress toward education and work individually on bringing them back to finish, finding out what the barriers are for completion. We have some part-time students who um, decide to, they, they start full-time and then go to part-time and then come back and go to, to full-time because a lot of them are facing, again, you saw our student body, they are facing financial challenges, some of them, um, even with financial aid, even with support from, uh, and we have you know, extensive financial support for them, but even so, some students really need to do other things for a while while they are pursuing their degrees, and we are accommodating to that. Thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport, follow on, or you're good? All right, very good. Uh, Regent Hipsch. Um, thank you, Regent Powell. Thank you, Chancellors. Um, as you know, I was a uh, student at Morris for a year, and I loved it. I loved the campus. I loved the, the feel of a small town. Um, I probably wasn't college material at the time I attended there, but, but uh, thankfully for Morris, um, it gave me that... Uh, stepping stone of uh, learning how to study and learning, not being too distracted with big city life. And, and it was a big push going from Perm to even Morris. And uh, so I really, uh, I think students like me that um, started off there, I think it gave us success. And so I want to thank you for that. And um, I want, you to, want to encourage you to also look for other students like me that are there now. 
because I think there's a lot of uh, first generation people of color in our region that you don't have to, we don't have to go a long ways to find people that, uh, we know that people tend to work where they get educated, so I think that's also important. And then I really wanna uh, commend you on your clear pathways, especially to places like law school. I don't know if everybody knows this, but we have a severe shortage of lawyers in Minnesota, both public defenders and also um, private lawyers. Just uh, there's, everyone's retired, we don't have lawyers. Uh, Who would have thought that, right? So, but uh, anyways, and the second one is the real challenge, working with businesses in the community to try to make those businesses stronger and vice versa. I think that's gonna pay a lot of dividends back. So thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Regent Hipsch. Uh, reactions or comments? Chair Powell, Regent Hipsch, thank you. Uh, students like you are among my favorite kinds of students. I'm also first generation, uh, four-year college graduate, and uh, I particularly feel uh, a kinship with the students who come and think, am I ready for this? Do I know what to do with this? And I agree with you that in our region, there are many students that we need to uh, work better to attract. There's the challenge often of students who are there who say, I want out of the small town. We're seeing that particularly uh, with the Hispanic population. Um, but we, um, again, if we can, as uh, Chancellor Holtzclaw said, bring them to campus, I think we have a better chance. So we will be working on that area. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair and presenters. Um, we've got a couple comments then, then follow up with a, with a question. So uh, it was remarkable and actually a lot of the personnel have changed since I came back to the board in, in 2015 after a couple of decade hiatus. And um, I came back and talking about, you know, talking about the Morris campus and saying, you know, well, it's the crown jewel of the university, uh, which is the, which was the moniker uh, that Morris had when I left in 95. And, and um, when people talked about some of the challenges that, that Morris was having numerically, um, certainly not quality, but numerically, um, I, I looked back and realized that Morris was still every bit as strong, but the world had changed kind of around it and that the Twin Cities and some of the improvements that the university had been pursuing for the Twin Cities had changed this, the ACT, the relative ACT position between the two campuses had, had, had shifted. And, um, you know, watching over these last several years, watching these numbers and, and, and what the trend is and wondering is this something that we can address um, within our own institution or is this something that's just simply a, a sea change that's, that, that, that can't be um, uh, uh, fought by the university. I'm, I'm, I'm very much in the region Kenyanya camp in that this is a really, very, it's a very valuable um, opportunity that's provided by the university and, and quite frankly the last year and a half I think really shifts things, I think, very much to the advantage of, of what is offered by the Morris campus. Um, you know, my feeling is that we, how we speak as an institution, as a system about our campuses has a huge impact on the success of those institutions. I still see Morris as the crown jewel of the university. I still see that, that, that focused liberal arts education in that setting as being something that is not available very many places and, and fewer places now uh, than ever. Um, you know, when, I, when you take the step back and you look at our system of campuses and you, and you think about the fact that, you know, each campus is so unique. I mean, you can have a regional campus that's regionalized for the area, which I think a lot of people would suggest would be, you know, a production agriculture, um, technical agriculture, um, much like I think Crookston is, has, has a focus of that variety. You have Duluth, which is really a regional campus of a very, you know, kind of a, an R1 in a smaller setting. Um, type environment, and then you have a very specialized medical education in Rochester. Morris has this, this I think, the most challenging role because they're offering a liberal arts education that's also offered on, on other campuses as well. Um, but I think that the setting I th is, is, is what's really special about it. Um, and so, you know, again, when you think about the changes in, in how people are leaving the condensed population areas in California to find places like Idaho, um, I, I think that that change in the, the technology allowing people to live in a more remote setting and be comfortable in a remote setting will, will serve um, Morris well in its, in its ability to attract people. Um, but I really do think that it, it, it kind of starts here. We have to talk about Morris 
I would love for Morris to be sort of our, um, you know, uh, call it a road scholarship. I mean, when you get into, you know, getting into Morris is something that, you know, is competitive and is really um, uh, special in that uh, it's something to be desired. Um, some of that comes in with some cost conversations, which I think most people know how I feel about that and, and how that has an impact. I mean, we even look within our law school, uh, you know, at one point in time, our law school was substantially less expensive than the privates. Just being admitted was a huge scholarship. That, that differential isn't really there anymore. And I think that having Morris as a public institution provide that financial benefit to people who are admitted versus going to these other private, small, rural, liberal arts. Um, I think there's an advantage there that we may not fully be taking advantage of and, and, and should be marketing, which leads me to my question. Um, I, I think that an institute, you know, certainly each of our campuses has a unique character. What is your marketing budget? And how does that, and, and do you know how that compares with other institutions that would perhaps be standalone? Um, the question is, is a little bit, um, uh, you know, slanted in that, you know, are, are, is it a penalty for Morris to be part of a system where you have to sort of presume that the university's overall marketing is your marketing, or do you have the real opportunity to market yourself as you would if you were a standalone liberal arts rural campus? Chair Powell, Regent Rocha, yes, <laughs> and and yes. Um, it is a real benefit for Morris to be part of the system. As I said, having the um, elevation of this, the five distinct campuses of the university was beneficial to us. Um, and I think there's more opportunity for that to happen if we say there are five University of Minnesota campuses again and again and again <laughs> and again. That does, it, it's simple recognition. We need that simple recognition of this giant institution. And we value our part of the University of Minnesota. Students from Morris graduate with a degree that says University of Minnesota. And that, that matters to the students who come to Morris or to Crookston or to Rochester or Duluth as well as to the Twin Cities. And I think that's crucial. We also though, the other yes, is we also do and must continue to do our own marketing because no one knows our campus identity as well as we do. We need the marketing that is in the moment, that can talk about the fantastic presentation that just happened over here, or over here, or over here, what our student groups are doing, what our student leaders are doing. So we need that combination of things. We have a $100,000 marketing budget for the Morris campus, um, and so with, uh, that amount, it's not a huge amount, but it's what we have to work with. And I think with targeted, coordinated strategies, which is what we are working on with Duluth and with University Relations Support and Ann Aronson's support and lots of other people helping guide us, I think we can make the most of that budget. Follow on? Yeah, sure, yeah, just, it, it, that's a, you know, a stunningly small number. Um, you know, for anybody that does marketing for any small business, that's not a huge number at all. Do you know how that compares with other, uh, other institutions of a similar size in a private setting? In a private setting, I can tell you, uh, I can't tell you numerically. Um, my children went to private liberal arts colleges though, and watching what comes out of Grinnell, um, for instance, tells me their marketing budget is a substantially larger. lot larger, but they have a $2 billion endowment um, which gives them a little more flexibility. And they serve a different population to some extent, but you're right, um, marketing will continue to be a challenge. Mr. Chair, if I just, just a closing comment, just I, um, I'm very happy to get a report from our crown jewel. We'll start you know, making that reference point again. Uh, but I think that that's something we really need to look at. When you look at the numbers, the fact that we haven't responded with a marketing focus, you know, not many businesses survive if they don't make those adjustments. And so I would certainly be in support of, of providing more support to, to move us in the right direction because I think what you offer is really important and an important part of the system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, before I wrap this up, anyone, anyone else? Uh, Regent Hibb. I'll go again. Uh, Chair Powell, and to Regent Rocha's comment, I, I couldn't agree more on the marketing. Uh, I know what it costs in a small town, Minnesota, to market a really small business, and it's a... Uh, and I know what it costs to do one billboard per year, and it's we're we're way underfunded there. I think so. I agree with that. So, oh, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, 
Sorry. Um, just briefly, I, I think earlier I had a two-part question, and um, I think we got to the first part. Uh, the second part was about the waiver. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm looking at here, but um, kind of if we can make it a priority to, to seek kind of federal support there, I think um, that's Region Emeritus Beeson speaking through me. <laughs> Chancellor holds clause, or who, who's, who wants to take that one? So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Powell, Regent uh, Kenyana. Uh, that is something which uh, we've been working with federal relations and continue to have that conversation, um, looking at ways that we can do that. We're also, um, we're probably uh, acting chancellor, um, can, can speak more about this, but we're also part of a consortium that's working together with other universities so that we can look towards having a more active and a, a federal waiver and federal financial support for that. Chair Powell, Regent Kenyanya, sorry, I missed the second part of that question. <laughs> um, I, I will just add to that, um, that Chancellor, former Chancellor Bayer worked closely with uh, President Stridicus of Fort Lewis College, which is another public council of public liberal arts colleges in Colorado that has a tuition waiver um, for the same reasons that Morris does historically, and that they have been involved um, repeatedly in, uh, in trying to bring the issue forward at the federal level. And, we'll, and uh, Chancellor Bayer will continue to um, have she's in Colorado, um, <laughs> have um, some connections there and will be helping us continue that, on that work. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, okay, well, thank you both for a very good presentation. It was very informative and I, I obviously interest is high in, in the work that you're doing and, and, uh, and you know, we look forward to seeing you again and, and, and best wishes for a very, very you know, strong start to the new year. So colleagues, here's what, uh, Let's do this. Um, I'm tempted to say that we're going to take a five-minute break, but really, I'm going to take a five-minute break. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, when we come back, um, we'll, when we come back, we'll we'll uh, look at uh, the report on the Peak Initiative, which is very important, of course. And then after that, there'll be a half-hour lunch break. Um, so we will we are going to let you know, let you eat. And then after our lunch break around noon, um, we'll come back and we'll have the. Um, uh, the campus master plan update, uh, which is pretty dense. So that's the plan for the rest of the afternoon. I, I'm, you know, we I know we have a hard stop at one, and I think we'll you know we'll, we'll make it. We'll finish. We'll finish you know, by one. It might be at one, but we'll finish by one. That's the plan. So a five minute break now, and then we'll reconvene. I <laughs>
I'm so impressionable. <laughs> Uh, all right, welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we'll turn now to item 11, which is a report uh, on the PEAK uh, initiative. And uh, I know there's very, very, very high uh, uh, board interest in this topic. I'm, I know we'll have a good uh, discussion. Uh, I want to welcome our presenters. Um, uh, first of all, uh, at the podium now or at the presenting table, Senior Vice President Franz uh, and Vice President Horstman. And then also, uh, as I understand it, uh, joining them at different points in the, in the presentation will be uh, Mark Finland and Andrew Laws. Uh, they are managing partners uh, with the Huron Consulting Group, and we have in, engaged Huron to help us with this exercise. Uh, Michelle Pugh, principal with KPMG International, uh, and um, uh, Lalo Buren, uh, a manager with KPMG uh, International. Uh, welcome to you all. We'll start off with uh, the two gentlemen seated uh, now, and I believe before uh, we turn it over to you, President Gable wants to make a few opening comments. Thank you, Chair Powell, uh, members of the board. Creating greater operational efficiency has been a priority for this administration standing on the shoulders of previous administrations, and we know it is of great importance to the board. The administration prioritized this goal early on in the planning process for MPAC 2025, and this focus is represented in Commitment 5, fiscal stewardship, in two main areas. It's a maroon and gold measure to engage in continuous improvement practices to promote efficiency in all aspects of operations, and it's in a dual maroon and gold dashboard focus to reduce administrative overhead year over year. So members of the board, our focus on improving operational efficiencies has accelerated due to the impacts from the pandemic as we've had to face significant and unexpected financial and operational challenges. So in response, we established the Finance and Operations Work Group back in April 2020 to make recommendations identifying cost savings. And a bold system initiative that emerged from that work is PEAK, which stands for Positioned for Excellence, Alignment, and Knowledge, which aims to explore new organizational models for things like shared services, streamlining administrative activities, generating recurring savings, leveraging investments in systems and technology, and potentially outsourcing or insourcing. <clears throat> it stands on the shoulders of previous operational excellence work completed over recent years, but it is a bigger, bolder, and different transformation initiative. It is intended to create these positive outcomes while also improving the quality of service and really making us a better institution from top to bottom. So Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, Myron Franz, and Vice President for Human Resources, Ken Horseman, are here to walk you through the assessment phase and to introduce you to our colleagues and friends at KPMG and Huron who've been helping us develop our options. We expect their recommendations will yield improvements in service, quality, staffing, and efficiency, amongst other positive outcomes. I have to thank the literally thousands of university community members who provided input into this process already, and we look forward to further consultation over the summer and into the fall as we seek to present to you a roadmap at the October meeting. So at this time, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to Senior Vice President Franz and Vice President Thank you. Thank you, President Gable. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, uh, and Vice Chair Figgum, members of the Board of Regents and President Gable. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We're excited to bring to you members of our consulting team uh, for you to meet and uh, understand their knowledge. We've been impressed with their expertise and work on, a, on our project thus far, and we're glad you have the opportunity to meet and hear from them directly. Um, as um, you mentioned, Mr. Chair, Andrew Laws and Mark Finnan from Finland from Huron, and Michelle Pugh and Lilo Byrne from KPMG will describe their assessment and, uh, and in terms of where we are in this particular pro uh, process. So uh, next slide, please. We want to make sure that the path forward uh, in the middle of the slide shows the efforts after we receive the report from the consultants on July 15. We will begin many, many tasks of working with the university community to design an implementation plan or roadmap, if you will, of how we can take strategic advantage of these opportunities in the years ahead. We will present our implementation plan to the board in October after our consultation and analysis of, of the peak report 
during the next three months. So the next three months will be very busy at the university working through the recommendations and opportunities that we receive from our consultants. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned on the left side of that slide, that they will be reporting on many of their assessments and opportunities that they have discovered. Uh, next slide, please. But let's step back before we proceed and talk about why we are here today. We start with the obvious but very important point that the University of Minnesota is a world-class institution for teaching, research, and service. The university achieved this status by vision, lots and lots of talent, and hard work. The PEAK initiative is a continuation of the effort to support that vision with our talented teams and lots and lots of hard work. But why this effort and why now? We all know the headwinds, as you can see on this slide, that challenge higher education in the years ahead, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. There's nothing new on this list, uh, but we believe that there is a new urgency today and that the time for action is now in order for all of us in this room and everyone across the university community to join in this charting of a roadmap that will guide each campus in the university for the next decade. Next slide, please. So how do we make the tough decisions that will, will be required for us to make systemic improvements? Our work on the PEAK initiative has been led by the same vision embraced by the University of Minnesota's Impact 2025 Strategic Plan. We must invest our efforts in strategic goals that are designed to increase our efficiency so that the highest percentage of every dollar we, of resource that we have is devoted to our core mission activities of teaching, research, and service. In order to achieve this result, we have focused our efforts so far on making those critical decisions that enable us to be good stewards of the resources that we have. We've been working over the last year with our consultants from Huron and KPMG to take the first step and, cha and design changes that will strategically align our efforts across the university. But if you're going to make strategic changes, you have to have the knowledge of where those opportunities exist within the university. And uh, with your permission, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to my new uh, Vice President of Human Resources, Ken Powell, and congratulations. Sir. Thank you. I uh, also uh, just changed my name to Ken Powell. Did I say Ken Powell? <laughs> Good promoted. <laughs> I, I always like uh, Vice President Horseman's hair, hair uh, style better, but that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that uh, comment, SVP Franz. Um, Let's be clear though, the PEAK initiative is really just another step along a pathway to enhance our efforts and our outcomes. Focusing on the last decade, the university has studied and analyzed our administrative efforts and made some significant reductions to overall costs, but those reductions were implemented relying on our current decentralized uh, governance model. Indeed, for FY22, uh, the budget just adopted by the board, each system campus and academic and administrative unit has had to meet reallocation goals through the budget planning process. These goals were often achieved through improvement to current processes. Shared service platforms have been designed and implemented to serve the needs in human resources and finance for multiple offices. Historically, this work has been performed in our current decentralized environment. Savings and improvements were realized, but often at a local, not system-wide level. In 2020, President Gable charged a finance and operations work group consisting of system-wide leadership, faculty, staff, and students. The work group, as you know, developed significant FY21 non-recurring programs to address the immediate budget challenges present as a result of the pandemic and reduced revenue. The work group also determined a second very important initiative, that is to strive for improved alignment of administrative processes that offer improved stewardship of resources year over year that are sustainable into the future and support the mission of MPAC 2025. That initiative is P. The Finance and Operations Workgroup has been expanded to act as an advisory council to the PEAK initiative. Prior to PEAK in 2020, Huron completed an assessment of the university's current administrative model. 
based on benchmarking with our peer institutions. And in February of 2020, Andrew Laws from Huron presented to this board the results of their administrative cost definition and bench benchmarking external review. Today, Mr. Laws will further provide insight uh, during his portion of the presentation. But based on this Huron analysis, the university did compare favorably to peers related to the proportion of the workforce focused on mission activity and was in, within range of other workforce metrics. However, on the Twin Cities campus, support costs such as institutional support, academic support, and student support uh, were higher than the peer median of 28%, with over 33% of overall costs in this area. <clears throat> Given our past focus on inc incremental cost reduction efforts, achieving significant improvement relative to peers would likely require a more system-wide structural approach. During the time frame and at the same during the same time frame and at the request of President Gable, KPMG conducted a series of interviews with university human resource professionals and stakeholders to provide an initial picture to the president of the current state of human resources. This report led to the next step of a survey to assess the current state of human resources system-wide in late 2020. The results of this work are informing the peak planning and analysis of a future HR strategy. Next slide, please. Huron and KPMG have studied and analyzed both the scale of our opportunities and our current investment in those opportunities. Our efforts have included 12 different functional areas in every campus. We have been reminded during this process of the uniqueness of programs and campuses across the university system and how they all contribute to the success of the university. We want to express our appreciation for the efforts of all those who contributed thus far, and we would not undertake the next phase without their support. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, we would like to invite Andrew Laws and Mark Finland from Huron and Michelle Pugh and Lila Boren from KPMG to now present to the board their findings. Thank you. Very good. Good morning to one and all. Maybe quickly introduce yourselves and then you guys, I'm sure, have a sort of choreography for who's going to go first. And go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell and members of the board. I'm Andrew Laws with Huron Consulting Group. Um, I think we're actually probably going to go in this order that we're lined up in. Um, but uh, I've been with Huron for about 15 years, worked for about 95 universities, and uh, as VP Ortsman just said, I think I was last with all of you in February of 2020. So good to see you all again. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Chair Powell and members of the board, I'm Mark Finland, also a managing director with Huron. I lead our strategy and operations team, which includes our organizational redesign uh, capabilities. I've actually worked across sectors, private sector, federal sector, as well as higher education. Um, one of the areas that I personally oversee is a lot of our organizational transformation work and have done this work currently with a number of other your institutions, including University of Illinois, Penn State, Wisconsin, etc. Thanks. Chair Powell, members of the, the board, I'm Michelle Pugh, uh, partner in Human Capital Advisory uh, with KPMG. Um, I've been in external consulting for uh, the better part of, of 16 years doing organization transformation, specifically HR transformations that are uh, technology enabled. Prior to that, I came from industry. I was in a number of strategic HR roles. Thank you for having me. Great, thank you. Chair Powell and the board, my name is Lilo Buren, and I'm a member of uh, KPMG's advisory team focused in on human capital uh, advisory, human capital management. Um, I have 15 years as an HR practitioner in addition to uh, several years of experience as a management consulting in the area of HR. All right, thank you. It's great to meet you all or see you all again. And uh, Mr. Laws, over to you. Great. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, so, um, as VP Hortzman said, when, when we visited in February, um, we went through a, I don't know, we probably gave a 100-page document of benchmarking and such, and really some of the takeaways were, again, that we compared favorably to peers on our mission headcount, 
which resulted in an attractive comparison on our non-mission headcount. Um, we also were growing our um, non-instructional non headcount at a lower rate than our peers do. However, when we converted those headcount ratios to expense ratios, um, some of the favorable results didn't quite transition. And so that left us in some ways scratching our head and trying to understand what the opportunity was. Um, that's what led us to, to think that we needed a more methodical approach and a, and a deeper dive and, and one that looks at all the in-scope functions and all the campuses that are in front of you today. If we go to the next slide, you can see how we've approached that over the last few months, um, both from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. Um, we've, on the left side, you can see we've done about 75 interviews and focus groups and engaged about 500 individuals through um, focus group and workshop sessions. We also um, conducted a survey um, President Gable mentioned thanking the thousands of people that have provided input. I think literally 6,000 people or more responded to our survey. Um, we um, conducted a, a smaller survey focused on some faculty members and the administrative roles they play. Our colleagues at KPMG had about 650 touch points with their deep dive in HR and a, a number of individuals um, like AVP Mike Volna and our project coordinator, Aaron Heath, um, uh, made Herculean efforts to help us collect data and we pulled um, as many as 200 different data sources to think about um, the, the depth of this opportunity and how we may move to the next steps. On the next slide, we, we highlight the case for change and, and I hope this is um, not too uh, redundant from SVP Franz, but uh, really five things came out. Our hypothesis was that going in, these were the things that would drive the case for change, and that's what our data showed. Of course, we start with Impact 2025, where we have a, a, a material need for resources and lots of investments we want to make in, in student services, innovation, discovery, et cetera. Um, the second item is this idea of efficiency. Um, that proved out true, and, and my colleague Mark Finland is going to walk through a little bit of that data, but as an example, um, when we looked across the 16 functional areas that we focused on, there's great variation in terms of the level of support that different units uh, receive and the investments that they're making in those. For example, uh, financial support at a college level. Um, some colleges have two, three, four times as many uh, resources supporting them than others do. So we think right sizing or, or, or shifting some of those resources can drive efficiencies. As a second point, service quality. Um, a number of items came up where stakeholders, stakeholder groups, campuses felt that they didn't get the level of service they needed from central resources. Those were things like um, our travel and expense system, um, functions related to student health, counseling, student support. Um, another good example was our uh, Drupal web content system that we rolled out. Um, so we found that there is opportunity in terms of the service levels we're providing and the consistency of those service levels. The fourth example we have here is leveraging technology. Um, our diagnostic suggested there's a number of ways we can do a better job of that. One good example is how we're leveraging research administration systems um, to support our faculty members. Um, part of that is, or a big portion of that is our pre-award components. Another example of leveraging technology is um, opportunities to better use robotic process automation for various functions such as treasury functions or maybe some student support functions. And then the final thing um, is related to our people with re regard to career paths. And, and again, my colleagues from KPMG will talk a little bit more about this on, on slide 15 when they, they talk about um, service delivery but thinking about how our current models are positioning our team members to advance through their career and to um, develop um, professional expertise in various areas. So um, in summary, the, the hypothesis proved true and, and we feel that um, the timing is right for this deeper dive and the additional um, 
work on service delivery. So with that, Chair Powell, I'd, I'd like uh, Managing Director Mark Finlan to, to continue on. Okay. Thanks, Chair Powell and the board. You can actually advance to the next slide. One of the things we wanted to do, um, organizational redesign um, can often be as much an art as a science, and having data to support not just identification of the opportunities, but to arm the institution with understanding how to address those is really important. So we did want to share a little bit from our administrative activity study. I think that will help bring that to life for you. Um, you'll see there are 16 different functional categories. We asked those 6,000 plus individuals on there were about 7,500 people that received the survey. We had 6,200 responses. I don't want to be careful to anchor you around that $620 million number. There's a number of things missing. One is just the survey response rate. Um, we didn't have a 100% response rate. It doesn't capture the administrative effort of a lot of your faculty on top of their teaching, research, and service. We're actually capturing that through other means beyond this survey. Um, it also doesn't include certain portions of the population of the staff. We didn't survey custodians or maintenance workers because we already know what they're spending their time on and them being more efficient is better served through other means than asking them to fill out an activity study. It also doesn't capture your spend on goods and services. So when you see IT spend, it's just the functional effort of these individuals who filled out the survey, not hardware and software and other spending. So that $620 million number is important for the purposes of um, this specific analysis, but isn't representative of all of your administrative spend. The four different things we want to highlight in terms of concepts and areas for improvement are distribution, scale, fragmentation, and consistency. So what does that mean? As people took the survey, we now understand throughout the five campuses, where is finance activity, marketing and communications activity, research administration activity, et cetera, happening? Not just at a high level, but an actual very detailed activity level. Where is it transactional versus strategic in nature, and what specifically are those activities? So that's helpful to understand where it's happening and by whom. Scale is the one concept Andrew mentioned. So if you actually think what type of level of support do people have in relation to their operating expenses or their number of FTE, where do we see higher versus lower levels of support, and how can we understand why that might be the case? Maybe there's a reason for it, maybe there's not a reason for it. Uh, fragmentation is a concept um, that's not only does not only happen in higher education, but it is very specific to higher ed in terms of one of the complexities of how do you address this. Oftentimes in the private sector, when you talk about distribution of activities, you have entire IT functions um, sitting in a company that you've bought. Here you're gonna find there's fragmented people in terms of someone spending part of their time on finance, part of their time in HR, part of their time on other activities. So as you think about restructuring, how do you take a portion of one person's time and think about how that might be differently or more efficiently by a more specialized individual? It's more complicated to, to actually implement those types of solutions. The last is just consistency. We'll actually show you people with the same titles across the institution oftentimes are doing very different jobs and that can create complexity, not just for the HR function, but for the individuals itself. So on the next slide, just to orient you at a very high level, we only have a few slides here, and I understand the data is very detailed, so I just want to orient you a little bit to it. This bar chart just represents those 6,200 FTEs that filled out the survey. What percentage of that overall 6,200 FTE of time is spent on the different 16 functional areas? So just to call your attention to the third bar from the bottom, general finance, accounting, and billing. 8% of time of the 6,200 FTEs is spent on general finance, so that's about for, uh, 485 FTE of time. That's not 485 people, that's percentages of people's time. It's actually much higher in terms of headcount because some people are only spending five or 10% of their time on finance, whereas central finance staff, as you would guess, are spending more like 80, 90% of their time on finance. So that's just to orient you at a high level to the data we're seeing from those 6,200 individuals who filled out the survey. Now to illustrate some of those concepts on the next slide, this is really meant to highlight what is some of the distribution. So let's actually just stick with finance and I'll walk you through that second column. Um, all the different units on campus are categorized as resource responsibility centers. These are both cost centers as well as um, revenue generating units, whether that's a college or a central VP's function. You can see that gold row at the bottom. Again, there's 485 FTE of finance activity happening across all five campuses from those 6,200 individuals that filled out this survey. 48.1, if you move directly above that, happens in the central finance function. Moving above that, 46.3 FTE happens across the four campuses, so Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester outside of Twin Cities. The range below that shows you the range across those four campuses. One only has 1.1 FTE in total focus on finance. One of those campuses has over 33 FTE focused on finance. And you move all the way to the top at Twin Cities, you have 
390.8 FTE of finance activity, which again ranges across 45 different RRCs between 0 to 75 FTE of finance. So that's 485 FTE of finance distributed across hundreds of headcount across all five campuses. So it kind of begs the question, where is there an opportunity for improvement there? And you can see we've done this for all 12 functions. We've shared on here also what that looks like for research administration, IT procurement, and marketing communications, just as examples for that distribution of activity across campus. If you move to the next slide, this is where I think things start to get more interesting. But again, we're still really just scratching the surface. Um, this shows you how many finance FTE per $10 million of operating expense exists in each one of those RRCs we just talked through. So that's all the different RRCs on the Twin Cities campus, as well as those RRCs or those four other campuses as well. And you can see the range is anywhere from four approximately finance FTE per $10 million of operating expense, all the way down to a very small number, almost to the point where you can't, can't see the bar with a median of 1.1. So this asks almost more questions than it answers which is what is the complexity of research and academics that might be driving that? Is it a scale issue? As you can imagine, some of these bars represent a much larger unit on campus than some of the other bars do. And really, we're just talking at the finance level. There's 10 or 15 different finance activity of data underneath this where we can run the same analysis for different transactional finance activities or more strategic finance activities as well. So sometimes people immediately look at this slide and start going to how much efficiency can we gain? What's the cost savings of rethinking this? I'd actually refer back to a conversation you were just having and Regent Roche asked the question about marketing at Morris. You can do this exact same slide with the marketing and communications data. You can drill down to the activity and you can start to use that data to help inform some of those strategic decisions you were just talking about. Who is spending what time on marketing and communications across all of Twin Cities as well as those four other campuses and start to think about how could we restructure and rethink as to how all of those individuals are spending their time and maybe re-divert resource and change time focus to be supportive of the activity you were just talking about at Mora. So I just want to understand there's lots of different ways to use this data informing beyond just the peak initiative as well as some other things you discussed also. We have included some quotes on the slide just to help you understand. This doesn't tell the whole story. We don't know what the service level is. So just so someone has more FTE versus someone else doesn't mean they're actually getting better service as well. So some of those quotes and hundreds of discussions we've been having again with your very committed and tremendous community help inform not just the data, but also the context behind the data we're seeing as well. If you move to the next slide, um, I understand this is a bit of an eyesore, but it really helps bring to life that uh, concept of fragmentation I was talking about before. So we've taken one job title, admin consultant slash analyst one. There's 86 different folks who took the survey that have that job code, and we've shown you 40 of them on the page. And this shows the fragmentation of how they're spending their time. On the left, you have someone who's really operating like an admin assistant. They're spending 100% of their time on general admin um, support activities. On the right, if you look at someone with the light blue, that's someone spending 100% of their time on academic program support. So the variety in how people are spending their time really makes it complex to figure out what should the compensation model be for these individuals? How do you create career paths for them? Um, how good can you really be at something for someone in the middle who's spending 10 or 20 percent of their time on one of the activities as opposed to someone who's spending a much larger percentage of their time on those activities? And actually, I would just link this back to the conversation we just had on marketing and communications. That's that light red color. You can see at least three different individuals on here who are spending 60, 75 percent of their time on marketing and communications. A number of other people spending 5, 10, 20 percent of their time on that. So as you think about how can we deliver marketing communications more effectively? How do you get at how that 10 to 20% of time one individual is spending, and how do you think about restructuring that? You've now left an orphaned 10 to 20% of someone's time. How do they now fill that gap and spend their time? Maybe they should be spending more time on finance or HR or IT. So that's really why you have to think about all of these functions in concert, because as you move something in one place, you actually create another area that you want to think about, which is why looking at all 12 of these functions together as you are really makes sense because of the people that are spending their time across a wide variety of functions. So how does this wrap together in opportunities? On the next slide, we have kept this pretty high level. Um, there are very detailed recommendations or opportunities we've identified across all of the different 12 functional areas. And this chart represents really the four different opportunity areas. In the upper left, you have organizational design. That's really the core of what we're looking at here. 
who is spending their time doing what and where in the organization. There's opportunities for you to rethink structuring that across all of the different 12 functions we've looked at. Beyond just who's doing the work and where they're sitting and how they're being managed and overseen, there's also how the work is getting done. You'd hope there's opportunities to rethink and improve that as we become more specialized in certain areas, particularly those more, str more strategic areas or have people focus more on the transactional work as well. Um, that's not always just the actual process of doing the work. There, there's compliance. We mentioned purchasing of services on here as an example. As you have more dedicated individuals focusing on procurement, they're going to understand what contract vehicles are available to them and what processes to follow through to make sure they're not buying something off contract that's going to create complexity for someone else. IT is kind of the obvious area. If you buy something that isn't a system that IT currently supports, you've now created cost and complexity for your IT team, so just having that increased knowledge of specialists and compliance with processes actually helps you be more efficient as well. Um, we'd be remiss not to mention enabling technologies, lots of areas for opportunity across the institution here, places where we're seeing uh, multiple different platforms, places where we're seeing one functional area pursue a solution that other functional areas could benefit from as well. Um, you also have a number of initiatives underway right now. There's one within research administration where they're um, implementing a software which should be extremely helpful in this area as well. So and this is not to say there isn't great activity already going on. Um, and the last we mentioned, talent and culture. This isn't just about efficiency and um, the overall university. It's really about the individuals as well. How are you creating career paths for them? How are you creating tremendous opportunities for them here to grow and expand within their functions? Um, which honestly is a perfect segue into the work we're gonna talk about next. We wanted to help bring this even more to life with a case study around HR as one of the examples of the 12 functions. So with that, I'd actually like to turn it over um, Chair Powell on the board to uh, our colleagues and friends from KPMG, and they're going to take you through a detailed case study now within the area of human resources to really drill down into one of those 12 functions. All right, very good, thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board. Uh, next slide, please. So um, support functions like uh, IT, finance, HR have been evolving over time, moving from uh, less and less administrative support and to, in, to more strategic support. A lot of this is because of the advent of advanced technologies, um, allowing employees to, at their fingertips, do a lot of these transactions themselves. Um, and along the same time frame, um, and we've seen this accelerated through COVID over the last 18 months, the future of work is changing. Um, we know that the, the profile of an employee is very different. Um, you know, we have up to five different generations of employees all of them together, and each of, they, each of the generations have different workforce needs. Um, the, uh, the movement of, of students is changing, too. We have a much more diverse student uh, population. Um, the way that they want to learn is different over time. And so um, the importance of, of HR becomes critical in this. They are pivotal to the... To the um, the, the movement of the university. They are able to interact with um, every different kind of employee from candidate to new hire to retiree. They really are the face of the university, the face of the organization to the community. Um, they are the stewards of the brand and the stewards of the culture. Um, and so as we're moving um, forward with the future of work and as HR has an increasingly uh, significant role in that, um, we found that HR needs to evolve over time. So um, what you'll see in the model in front of you um, is the evolution that's taken place over the last couple of decades, actually. Um, if you look at the upper left, the direct access, that really is um, you know, the employee self-service, if you will, on your computer, on your mobile phone, the ability to um, access any transaction, um, you know, complete open enrollment, make an address change. Um, frankly, the, the number of different employee transactions can be as vast as, as you would want it to be in the university. Um, of course, the more that we're able to push out from a self-service perspective, um, the less that the HR uh, professionals in, in the units in the colleges um, need to do from an administrative perspective. Um, underneath that is shared services. Um, this is not necessarily a center. It doesn't have to be one physical location. Um, what it is is a centralized way of doing things consistently. Um, again, you can bring as much into a shared service as you want um, or leave as much resident in, in the business or um, the colleges as you'd like. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. 
Um, but typically, when direct access and shared services are working effectively, you'll see between you know, 75 and 98% of first call inquiries resolutions being handled at that level. Um, the importance of that is um, those tend to be more inexpensive requests, so we really want to drive inexpensive requests to an in inexpensive way of operating and, and let our professionals have a more strategic role in the business advising around the, the future of work. So if you look at the, uh, the bottom right, the centers of expertise, this tends to be a relatively small, highly specialized um, group of people that know how to create strategy programs. Um, they're the owners of policy and, and processes. So they're the ones who will um, identify the most important workforce segments and how to source those and where to source those. Um, they'll, ha they'll help um, engage and develop your employees through programs that can be um, pushed out enterprise-wide. And then the top HR strategic partners, those truly are the individuals who are resident um, in the colleges, in, in the business, interacting with your, your deans and your chancellors, um, the leaders, um, to appropriately customize the programs that are coming out of the centers of expertise um, to meet the needs of the business. Um, you know, not all industries have been evolving to this model as quickly as others. Um, you see industries like financial services, right, being very technology enabled, moving much more quickly. And then, of course, you see industries like higher ed or healthcare with hospital systems moving slower. Um, mostly because of the organic growth that you see across those industries. Um, the way that they've evolved um, has led to really independent ways of operating. Different colleges, different hospitals doing their own thing. Um, and with that independent way of operating, it becomes more and more difficult to, to pull those activities into a centralized way of, of operating. Um, the university has begun to move forward in that. You have a call center and you're taking um, some of those initial questions in your call center already, but there's, there's much more room to move. Next slide, please. So from a, a larger industry perspective, um, Gartner did a, did a study. It's a, it's a 2020 report. The data came out of 2018, 2019. And what they found is that 68% uh, of the organizations that they've interviewed actually have taken HR activities and put them under an HR department. Right Outside of that, all of the remaining percentage have HR activities that are being done you know, somewhere across the organization, and, and we'll see how the university fits in with that in a moment. Um, and then only 11% actually have fully leveraged the model that I just talked about, all four elements of them. Um, you know, increasingly they're taking on more and more, and, and typically the, uh, the organizations that have more sophisticated technologies are able to advance a little bit quicker to that model. Next slide, please. So obviously, as, um, as an organization moves closer and closer to the model, um, they are able to add value to the university, to the organization that they support um, from, a, from a cost and an efficiency standpoint. Um, you know, processes that have the right people attached to the right activities with the right skills tend to do things more effectively, more efficiently. Um, risk controls, you know, when you're specializing around important areas like employee relations, you want to have a consistent way of operating so you're able to manage that risk profile of, of, of the university a little bit more. Um, uh, more effectively. And then, uh, you know, obviously just improving your business impact across the university um, and the organization. Um, doing more with same, doing more with less. So as you grow, as you change, your support functions don't have to grow commensurate with that. They can, they can um, still operate successfully at the same level. Next slide, please. Um, so similar to the activity um, survey that we, we just spoke about in the other 11 functions, we started um, our uh, approach with, with the university doing this activity study. Um, and we sent uh, surveys out to about 1,000 people. We got responses from about 60% of those. So directionally, um, it provides some decent information for us in terms of how people are spending their time. A couple of things to point out on this slide. Um, the first, if you see below that other 30%, 
Um, similar to um, what Andrew and Mark had talked about, this is the amount of time that people are doing things outside of HR. So what this means, and what's interesting, right, is three, 537 people are doing HR activities. You only have about 225 people with an HR title. So that means you've got upwards of 300 people doing HR activities that are not resident in an HR function. And that is probably directionally even higher if we would have had a 100% um, response rate across that population. The other thing that's, that's interesting is the, the table to the right, uh, where people, where you're spending your money. Um, and number one and two are employee relations. Obviously employee and labor relations very critical. Um, this is expensive because so many people are touching it. So when you take the pieces and parts of everybody's salary um, doing those types of activities, that's what drives the expense of this. Um, one of those areas that you don't want pieces and parts of people to do is employee relations from a risk perspective. Um, the number three, talent acquisition. Again, as we had talked about, um, the future of work. Obviously, recruitment is increasingly important. Um, so uh, it would not be out of sorts to have talent acquisition as a high spend group. Um, the activities, however, that are driving spend here are the really administrative transactional activities. Um, sourcing through resumes to pick the right candidates based on qualifications. There are technologies you can do that with. Um, doing I-9, scheduling interviews, a lot of those uh, lesser value add activities that are taking up large chunks of people's time um, that should be spent on interacting with the hiring manager, really finding out quality candidates, um, bringing can quality candidates to the table, um, increasing diversity. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide speaks of fragmentation, and, and I won't drain this slide, but in keeping with employee relations, um, if you look at that third row down, um, of all the, the 537 people that we um, that completed the survey, um, if you add up all of the time that they'd spend on employee relations, it equals 55 FTEs of work. Now, this isn't an assessment of whether or not 55 FTEs of work is appropriate for the university. It, it doesn't speak to leading practice. It just says people are spending 55 FTEs worth of work. However, you'll see that almost 300 people touch that employer relations work. Um, what you tend to want in, in areas like employee relations is a one-to-one -one ratio. You really want people who are um, focused on employee relations, know how to do it consistently, know how to investigate, know how to you know, uh, use the policy and process appropriately, um, and um, 300 to, to 55. And as you go down um, the rows, you're seeing um, similar uh, variations in, in uh, ratios. Next slide, please. So uh, we heard about you know, what's going on in the industry. We talked a little bit about what, what we found from the activity analysis at the university. Um, but what's really important is the changes that we make. We don't want to degrade the employee experience. In fact, we want to enhance it. Um, so all of the recommendations that we'll see in a moment um, are foundational to the employee experience. We um, focused. Um, a, a number of, of weeks talking with deans and chancellors, other faculty, um, employees in all of the other workforce segments um, to find out what's going well from them for, for them when they're interacting with HR and what's not. Um, you know, typically when you think about HR making changes in the past, what they would do is they take a look at themselves, take a look at how they execute their process. They'd figure out how to make it easier on them, take out some process steps. And whereas that would lead to simplification and sometimes it would lead to cost reduction, it very rarely led to a, an improved customer experience. So we really want that to be foundational in everything that we do here. So after talking with you know, 150 people across different workforce segments, we found that um, your employees think that HR is inconsistent. Um, so that's similar to what we're seeing with the work activity analysis. Um, 
they're seeing that there's a lack of clarity. Who do I go to for what? How do I find my answers? Why are answers inconsistent? You know, sometimes they answer shop, right, depending on the person um, that they'll talk to. Um, they don't feel understood. Um, recruitment is always a, an issue that comes up, and they, they don't feel as though they're getting the appropriate um, recruitment support. When you contrast that to what they want in the future, they want more training. Um, they want more diversity. They want to focus on equity and inclusion. Um, they want more time to do their job and not do HR type of transactional things that could be done um, either very quickly through self-service or, or through a call center. Um, they want to find what they need. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this is a, a fun slide. So let me just orient you very quickly to the slide. On the right side where you see the, the 29 um, opportunities, these are our preliminary list of opportunities. Um, these take into consideration what we found in our process sessions, in our uh, work activity analysis, in, in talking with your employees from an employee experience perspective, and also leading practice when we've worked with other universities and organizations in the past. On the left-hand side with the matrix, we've also done a preliminary mapping of how long um, each of these activities take from design through implementation based on when we've done these in the past. Um, and then um, up, the, up the, the vertical is the value to the university. Um, qualitative value as well as quantitative value. So just to pull a couple out to see um, you know, what, what we're thinking of in terms of, of opportunities. Number three is end-to-end -end process design. Um, obviously, it's, a, it's the start that, you know, we'd, we'd want to do initially, driving efficiency, driving effectiveness, taking all of our findings from our, our employee experience and making sure we take those, those forward. Um, this allows us to um, drive the specialization, help with career pathing, understand the roles um, and the skills that are needed to execute each of those activities. Um, if you take a look at number seven, optimize existing PeopleSoft application. We know that you've put a significant investment into PeopleSoft, and it will be around for a while. So as long as it's around, let's make sure that we leverage the functionality available to it. PeopleSoft can do a lot more than it does right now. You can execute self-service through it. Um, so let's take a look at you know, how do we leverage it to its fullest extent, given the investment that you've put into that? Um, and then one last one, if you look at number 23. Um, so assess HR, vendor performance, and associated costs. Often what we see when we've got decentralized organizations, universities, is that um, they have some independence on their vendor spend. So you're paying once twice, three times um, over what you could be spending. So let's do an assessment across the, the university, find out the vendors you're using, find out what those vendors are being used for, and identify if people are paying um, a couple of times for something when they only need to be um, paying for it once. And that's a real simple way of driving cost efficiency. Um, obviously, we. Um, you know, when you look at where the, the ball sits in that one, the value to the U of M being um, kind of mid-range, um, that's just conservative. We're not sure, because we haven't done the assessment yet, what we may find. Next slide. And one more, please. OK, so in terms of next steps, um, so from an HR perspective, we have a, a list of opportunities we have a preliminary assessment of where those are plotted. Um, what's important now is going to be a couple of things. Um, through summer, we'll want to make sure that we meet with HR leadership and uh, decide if our sequencing, if our priorities actually are where they should be, given where the university wants to move, given the impact that they'll have on the university. Additionally, we've got 11 other um, functions that are going to have a, a number of opportunities coming from them as well. Um, so we'll also want to get with Huron and the other functional leaders to make sure that we prioritize those opportunities and sequence them as a holistic program to make sure the combination of those opportunities are going to drive what's intended across the organization. And then, of course, by, um, by October, we'll be able to provide you with a, um, a more detailed business case 
case in terms of the qualitative and quantitative benefits that you'll get from that consolidated list of, of opportunities and the sequencing um, to inform your decision making. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what next? Or do we want to go back to uh, our vice presidents or, or open it up for questions or how would you like to go next? Or where would you like to go next? Chair Powell, I think I was uh, instructed that we could take questions from uh, the board if there are any, and if not, um, uh, we would invite SVP Franz and VP Hortzman back up, and we would take questions with them. So I think it's well. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to be questions. So, uh, <laughs> so let me, um, maybe I'll start with with one, just a quick one, while while we're racking these up. Should we, is the way to understand kind of how we're going to move forward that, we're, that the HR function in a way will be the first mover, that, that we will lead with that function and then, and then uh, it, will, it will expand to other functions or are we going to be moving? I mean, there's huge, a huge amount of potential change here, I mean, gigantic. And so I guess the question is, how are we going to, can you give us some idea of how we're going to be sequencing? Chair Powell, yes. um, we, uh, we, we started a little bit earlier for HR, which is why you're seeing that we have those um, opportunities already identified. Here is very quickly catching up with us. So no, we won't necessarily um, move forward with HR faster. That's for us to decide through um, summer and also get the approval of the board in terms of what makes the most sense. So in October, we'll come with a, with a recommendation of how we'd like to move forward as an integrated PEAK program um, and all of the initiatives we'd We'd like to move forward with, and um, and you know, for your advisement. Okay, uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell. And wow, there's a lot here, a lot, a lot, a lot. So, a couple questions, and then a comment. And I may hang on to the comment till we bring uh, Vice President Horstman and Senior Vice President Franz back up. But two questions, and uh, they relate to projects that were initiated under President Gable's predecessor's administration, one of which is done and the other of which I, or I think is done and the other of which is, is, is not done, but largely done. And that was, and, I, and my question revolves around how much of that are you seeing and how much of it still needs to be done and whether we're gonna have to redo any of it. But the enterprise system upgrade project, ESUP, which I think had an HR, a student and a financial portal component to it, and I think Ms. Pugh just got to the PeopleSoft element of that. But when we launched that, it was all about eliminating customization and you know taking steps through the IT function of the university to implement a, a lot of what you're talking about. So my question is, I hope that was good work. I hope that you can build on that, and I hope that uh, that you know we don't need to go back and, and start over with any of that stuff that we laid some good groundwork there. Let me ask my second question and then maybe you can come back and, and see if that one made sense and whether we're doing it. The other one, which I know from Vice President Horstman's commentary over the last year is not done yet, and that was the job classification work. A lot of that's done, but not all of it. But as you went through the fragmentation elements of this, the distribution stuff, it just, it spoke to me about the importance of that job classification work and that some of this work that you're doing really depends on that having been done right. So help me with those two elements of work that was in underway or in place when you got here. Ms. Q. Chair Powell, um, Regent McMillan. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not, um, I'm not up to speed on the details of ESOP. Um, however, what I, what I will say is that um, when we do the end-to-end -end process design, that will inform the functionality, obviously, of the technology. What we'll do holistically for each of the processes is take a look at all of the different technology touch points um, that, inter that allow for um, the execution of that process. PeopleSoft will be just one of those. There'll be um, many others. And we'll be doing process design across all of the functions. Um, certainly all of the work, as I mentioned, the investment, um, you know, has not been done in vain. If anything, hopefully there'll be just small tweaks. We'll need to make a decision on um, uh, 
what types of employee self-service, manager self-service, you think is appropriate to allow your employees and managers to do. Obviously, the more we're able to push off, still um, making good use of that employee experience takes work off of you know, the organization. So that will, be, that will be the goal, figuring out how do we better leverage um, the functionality you have against how the processes are designed. Our goal is always to reduce customization as much as possible and, and go in with, with a vanilla solution. Um, in terms of the job classification, and then I'll, I'll open it up to, to my colleagues, um, I think what, what we're seeing in universities holistically, as we see in some other um, industries, um, there's a lot of uh, personal investment in your title. Um, and often titles are, are given to individuals in lieu of compensation. Um, often, as we had talked about, people have the same titles doing different things, and some people ha are do, you know, have different titles doing the same things. Um, I know that uh, work has been done in the job classification, so similar to PeopleSoft, we'll want to take a look at the job that the, the work that's been done to date on the job classification and make sure it, it, it meets the needs of the, the future. Chair Powell, can I, can I, can I add, is yes, that okay? Please. Yeah, please. So, so I just wanted to recognize that a lot of times when we do these projects, they're in um, partnership or in parallel with those types of technology transformations like ESOP. That's the case with our work at um, Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, Iowa State, Tennessee, where we're doing similar stuff. Um, with our assessment to date at Minnesota, really where we've come across opportunities to better leverage technology and improve processes through technology, those have been um, related to ancillary systems like research systems, like your CRM systems, things like that. It, it hasn't pointed to the need to revisit the ESOP initiative. So I do think that the board should be comfortable that that laid a good foundation and is, President Gable suggested earlier that all this work is being done on the shoulders of that past work. So. All right, recent uh, follow-up. Yeah, thanks, Chair Powell, and thanks for those answers. And I probably shouldn't have framed the question around the, the ESUP work as saying, I hope it was all good. If you we're paying you to come in here and help us understand whether what we've done is good and whether it can be built upon. So, you know, we obviously want uh, the honest and straightforward answer of, boy, that was the wrong pick or this is the wrong direction. But Hopefully it won't be, but uh, we, we, we need to hear and we're paying for your external expertise to help us understand that. So thank you. All right, uh, Regent Swigum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, let me add my uh, wow to Regent McMillan's uh, wow in the last half hour presentation. Way above me. I, I can't put it all together. Um, you fours are smarter than I, and that's why we're paying you. <laughs> Let me look ahead, though, and, and I, I think you're probably coming up with lots of great ideas and lots of redesign ideas. Let me look ahead to October, if I can. And when we look at the redesign and the implementation, I think, is the schedule. Um, the only thing that you said that I can relate to is uh, um, title changes in lieu of compensation. I used to do that at the state capitol all the time. I'd, I'd give a lady a new title change, but wouldn't give her any more money. And well, she felt good for a couple of weeks until she realized her pay didn't go up. Uh, tell me what we're going to do to get the university community, our staff, our uh, personnel, our unions, or whatever, to to buy this change, to buy this pre-design. You. You have great ideas, I'm sure you do, but you got to get buy-in from 26,000 folks who are going to be yelling and calling us and screaming at us and you're eliminating my job or you're putting me in a different spot. Look me ahead to October. What's, what's your plan? What's your strategy to help us get buy-in to this significant, important strategy of this redesign implementation you're coming up with? Chair Powell. Um, yeah. Regents Vigum, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. You, you've, you've asked the million dollar question um, about this. It, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to answer it, but you've asked really the most salient question, which to some extent is why this path forward extends for a number of months, because while we've unearthed opportunities, many of which the community was aware of, and we've put some new dimensions around it, 
It's how do we actually get people excited and on board to move off of the current status quo? I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, you know, back in 2019, I was working with a similar institution. We uncovered these opportunities. The leadership team just couldn't get aligned that they really wanted to tackle this. The project was about to die. Um, I guess it was being in 2020 at this point. COVID hit and they changed their minds. And they said, we have to do something now. We can't continue operating like this. Our costs and our budget won't allow for it. It took that event for them to align the community to actually move forward and making some of these changes. So to some extent, it's a question of the don't, will. Don't, don't lose a crisis, right? Th that was, that was how they approached it. I'm not saying that's how it'll be approached just at the U, but you're, you're absolutely right. You have to get people energized and excited to do something different. And part of the goal here is to have 12 individual work teams that aren't just the senior leaders of these 12 different functions. It's the community. What faculty are going to be impacted by this? What staff are going to be impacted by this? What constituents outside the institution are going to be impacted? You have development and some other things on here. And to start to get them in the dialogue of, all right, here's the opportunity what solution is actually going to work for the U and getting them to co-create that solution. Like you said, the consultants can't do that. That has to be owned by the institution, the university, the leadership team of the university. And even when we get to this design and implementation, that process hasn't stopped. Designing how are we actually going to move people around or do work differently in a way that makes sense. If the people that are impacted by that aren't the ones involved in designing what that solution looks like, it's going to fail. So I do think you have to prepare yourselves for it. This is not a fast process for many of these things. It does take some time to make that investment to get the reward at the end. We have seen institutions be successful, but to your point, if you try to do it fast, you don't engage the community, you don't think about how to motivate people to want to change, it's, it's not going to be successful. And just to, uh, uh, oh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Powell and, and Regents Tickham. Just to add on uh, and amplify uh, what Mark was sharing, one of the things that we're doing is we're actually capturing uh, the various stakeholders and working with the university to understand who they are, who do we need to gain buy-in from, who do we simply need to inform, who do we simply need to educate uh, so that the changes that we're presenting uh, they can help us by being change champions uh, for what we're promoting. So, Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, <clears throat> the design implementation, unless you get ownership, unless you get buy-in along the way, ain't going to happen in October. Yep. Yeah. If I could just add one comment, um, <coughs> Chair Powell and Dean Spigum. Being responsive to people's feedback is, is helpful. The faculty came back and said, we feel like we want you to really capture what administrative time we're spending on these activities. We weren't given the activity study, which they're not usually because 80% of their time hopefully is spent on research and, and teaching. It's a small percentage. So we've actually created a different instrument and sat down with different faculty groups to say, we would love to hear specifically where your pain points are. So hearing that feedback, engaging them how they want to be engaged and you know, not being in compliant or inflexible on the process, I think is really important. So pulling the faculty in in a way that they want to be engaged is really important. We're certainly not done. We're right at the beginning of that. Continuing to engage them will be important. Mr. Chairman, just very quickly then, your awareness of that gives me comfort okay. that this could be successful. Uh, President Gabriel. Yes, and, and just to clarify, uh, Mr. Chairman, Regent Sigmund, I may have misunderstood, but the recommendations come in October and then the implementation would start. I mean, this is a long game. So it's not as if no. we would come with baked implementation plan and just start rolling and that's this this is many steps yeah. and we have to think hard i mean we'll have to think hard thinking the role of how speaking from experience uh one more uh, then we we're, we're going to have to wrap it up here we're going to run out of time region him uh chair powell the only question to f f uh, region swiggins question oh. is five years down the road does it work? <laughs> you know, meaning, uh, have you seen the savings that you say you're going to see? Or are we seeing the efficiencies? You know, the first one through the wall always gets bloody, and uh, you don't want to be the first one through, but uh, does it work? And, we, and so, question. Region Russia, quick. Dude, no, that's just my question. Uh, question for an answer or a comment? I'm looking for an answer for what my question was. Uh, 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 Does it work? <laughs> yeah, Chair Powell in, in uh, Regent. You don't have Who's... to worry about pronouncing that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your generosity. <laughs> if I understand your, your, your question correctly, it's really about the time horizon for implementing these changes. And, and we, we're certainly sensitive to the fact that we need to do something within three-year time horizon.
Yeah, absolutely. Chair Powell, I would just add, you're not the first one through the door. I think the, the slides shared by KPMG earlier said that about 11% of, of you know, entities are evolving, 16% had hybrid models. That's pretty similar um, in higher ed. We, so Huron's worked with about 40 institutions to make this type of transition. Again, there's seven or eight that we're working with right now, so there's plenty of lessons learned to move forward with, and I think there's a great probability of success five years out. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be quick here. So I, first of all, thank you. Uh, this is you know, uh, fascinating. It's a tremendous amount of information. You know, from a policy standpoint, it, you know, to me, this is that intertwining of, of policy and administration that I think is healthy for a board to have these dialogues. Oftentimes we talk about, you know, if someone were to say we're talking about 2.4 hours of this individual spent on auxiliary activities, you'd be, whoa, 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 you're the policy board. That's, you know, that's too specific. But this is really helpful to kind of understand our broader policy directives about controlling costs, being efficient, and so on. So I, I thank you for that. And actually, you, you sort of got to the, the question that I was, was getting at is sometimes when I look at this, it's if you're in a, a for-profit enterprise, you can kind of track value pretty easily by performance and dollars and cents. But in higher ed, um, there's, we've got all these other missions that don't, aren't reflected in a check that comes through you know, in, into the till. And so I, uh, my question, and I don't know that necessarily even has to be in the form of a question, is you know, uh, understanding how we calculate uh, our, our model differently than would be a straightforward for, for profit, where sometimes you have to be a little decentralized to have access to lots of people and, and, and lots of constituencies, and just wondering how, how that fits into your analysis compared to um, a, a, a more predictable private sector enterprise. Anyone want to take a shot at that? Uh, please. Yeah, Chair Powell. Regent Rocha, um, we'd obviously want a baseline, a number of metrics. I mean, and, and that goes to, to your, um, your question as well. Um, so we can see movement over time. So we'll take a look at, you know, what strategically, from a mission perspective, what are you trying to drive? Um, we obviously know that, um, you know, spend toward more strategic initiatives is important, efficiency, effectiveness, those are. But what are those, um, what are the metrics that actually drive um, those results, and then let's start to, to measure those on a six month, a nine month, a year basis to make sure we're moving in the right direction. And every change that we make is um, is, is valuable uh, quantitatively, qualitatively for the university. All right, thank you. Uh, on that note, thank you, presenters. Hey, thank you very, very yeah. much. It's very dense, uh, in, in <laughs> yeah. real, but uh, but very, very important. And I think we have a sense for where you know our, our next few very big steps. And so that October meeting will be will be will be you know critically important. So what we're going to do now is recess for lunch. Um, we'll reconvene at quarter past twelve because um, we have one more important activity. And, and I, just to remind everyone, um, I think there are a number of people around the table here who have a, 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 another meeting at one. And so we do, in fact, have a hard stop at one. So I'm gonna gavel us back into session at quarter past. So we'll uh, recess.
So we got to go. Thank you very much. Change your mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all yours. I mean, you've done it before. All right. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to uh, continue the meeting now with uh, item 12, which is uh, the Twin Cities Campus Master Plan right. Doesn't Update. Uh, joining us for the discussion is uh, Senior Vice President Franz, Vice President Bertelson, Monique McKenzie, who's Director of Campus Planning, and Greg Havens, who we've all met before, uh, Principal at Sasaki. So, um, Senior Vice President Franz, I'll turn it over to you for a bit of intro, and I think as everybody knows, we're going we're gonna to have a hard stop here. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and uh, Vice Chair Sviggum, members of the board, President Gable. I want to introduce a few slides, but I want to get you to uh, Mr. Havens quickly because he's the uh, the main attraction today, not me. So, but what we want to do is set the stage here, and I think one of the things that uh, we're here with today with an update on the th our thinking for the Twin Cities campus plan. We're seeking your input now because we want to develop specific recommendations that will be the basis of the draft plan we bring to you in October for final action in, in December. Now, as a regular practice across our Minnesota systems, the University of Minnesota system, we create physical plans for each of our campuses to address questions of growth, capital renewal, and, inter and interaction with the surrounding community all based on the priorities shaped by the institution's 2025 plan and our mission of teaching, research, and service. As you may, some of you will recall, in February of 2021, this board adopted principles, and I just want to review a couple of those principles as we go into this discussion. Some of those principles included establishing a sustainable vision of how the physical setting of each campus will embody its distinctive history, mission, and future. The second one is creating an inclusive and welcoming experience for the increasingly diverse range of people who come to campus. And third, we want to optimize the existing physical assets to facilitate flexible and innovative solutions in the future. Fourth, we want to make sure that the cost of attendance, investment, and operations when we're planning for the future are taken into account. And fifth, we want to integrate each campus's master plan with the system-wide strategic plan and six, we want to ensure that there's an inclusive, accountable, and forward-looking process for developing and implementing the master plan, which obviously starts with the board. The campus plan acts as a guide for us to invest in our campus. The plan supports the institution's mission and strategic goals. It determines the best overall use of, of existing land, development sites and facilities, and it promotes a positive relationship with our neighbors and adjacent entities. Perhaps the most important of all is that it establishes a vision for the future in the near term and long term. From today's vantage point, what should be done within the next 10 year or 30 year horizon, really we want to ensure that the TC campus, the Twin Cities campus, will capture our aspirations, serve our community, and advance our goals. So once again, I won't spend much time on this slide because we talked a lot about the strategic commitments, but again, the, the M, PAC 2025 and the strategic commitments align very closely with what we're trying to do. We've been, this provides a compelling structure in how we build the vision. They uphold the considerations for us in terms of building a strong community. Now, as, as you may recall at the retreat in April, you gave us some feedback at that point about how the strategic commitments shown here could be translated into tangible on the ground projects and, and initiatives. We've absorbed that feedback and considered these, uh, that with our presentation today of a series of big ideas that will influence the future campus in tangible and measurable ways. So the balance of this presentation then is devoted to a guided tour, if you will, from our consultant Sasaki about some of those big ideas translated into concepts for projects that would shape the character of our future campus. And with that, and with the chair's permission, I'll ask uh, Greg Havens from Sasaki to take over, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Sasaki. Well, thank you all for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Uh, as we look to the future, the ideas that are beginning to emerge from this planning process are what we're terming big ideas. Now, these ideas that you see presented here are not ranked in order. 
They're merely for discussion purposes today. But the ideas are emerging not only from what we're, the feedback we're getting from this committee and this, the Regents group, but also from the other committees that we're engaging with in this process, as well as the observations we've had looking at the campus environments and examining the materials provided to us. In addition to that, we've been informed by the survey that was issued to the campus community some months ago. All of that's gone into helping us synthesize what we think are the emerging big ideas that will guide development here for the next 10 years or longer. These ideas uh, embrace a number of things that are aligned with the strategic commitments, including creating a more inclusive campus environment, uh, supporting patient care and providing exper uh, a better experience in health sciences, and also promoting innovation through partnership, just to make, name a few. As noted, we will look at each of these as they apply and translate into the campus environment. We are seeking to align these with the uh, Impact 2025, making sure that each of these big ideas do align with the five strategic commitments, and we'll continue to explore these ideas as we move through the process and ensure that we are uh, really presenting an integrated, coherent strategy for the future. As we consider the campus, and we are looking at the entire environment here of West Bank, East Bank, and St. Paul. We're taking into consideration not only the campuses themselves, but looking at the relationships with the surrounding neighborhoods and communities, but also acknowledging your important position in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and all the opportunities that presents to the university. Given the number of Fortune 500 companies here and the opportunities for entrepreneurship for engaging with the community and other businesses and neighborhoods as well. But importantly, the opportunity to focus on innovation as we look to the future. On this slide, um, the reason it's a little blurry, the color is this is both a concept and a place at this point. The University of Minnesota has a history of excellence in leadership and innovation. One of our current strengths included robust startup culture and established corporate engagement efforts at the university. One of the emerging initiatives based on President Gable's leadership is to enhance the university's state and regional leader leadership in multiple innova innovative areas. We call this initiative Innovation Corridor. Innovation Corridor today is a concept to engage in innovation throughout the university and will potentially become a place with a goal for some of this new innovation to happen on our campus. We envision that the initiative will include the bio-based manufacturing that you've heard about with BioMade, the clinical and med tech space, additional activities that attract world-class talent, drive innovation, and create dynamics, new startups, and jobs. This is a key part of the Impact 25 strategic plan and the use commitment to the Minnesota and the larger world. In the Innovation Corridor development efforts are planned to advance the university's teaching, research, and service missions by connecting with the private sector and other partners with university talent, research, and students. One important function of the Innovation Corridor effort is to recruit private companies with which the university desires to connect. Specific locations on or near campus are envisioned to develop in support of key disciplines and industry. For example, in Minneapolis, the focus would be on health science, med tech, neuroscience, and early childhood development. In St. Paul, the focus would be on agricultural, food, agriculture, food, environment, and biomanufacturing. The approach of aligning the university with other partners is intended to direct activity so that gaps in the University of Minnesota research infrastructure may be filled and the scholarly priorities of the faculty may be advanced. The university would consider providing support such as real property, financial, and workforce to advance these types of partnerships on a transaction by transaction basis. As the diagram shows, the campus plan is mapping multiple possible locations that could, that could enhance the goals and objectives of the innovation corridor. This, is, this includes some of the land owned by the university, such as in the East Gateway and the 2407 location. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Havens. We're also considering all campus land and all 1,271 acres across uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul and the 23 million square feet. As we do look to the future, though, we're also bearing in mind the populations we will be serving. Uh, we understand that enrollment will maintain, be maintained at around 33,000 undergraduate students with uh, graduate enrollment and, uh, remaining constant. 
We also know that uh, we, we could expect some increases in faculty and staff numbers as we begin to think about new um, academic activities and research, the research enterprise. So all of that will be factored into the way we consider the future. Moving more specifically to how we're looking at each of the locations, beginning with West Bank, the idea here is to really reinforce these big ideas introduced earlier by rethinking aspects of this campus environment, notably Anderson Hall, which would be replaced in the future with a new student-facing building, one where the accommodation could be made for additional classrooms, but also the opportunity to bring in additional amenity space for the student population and, in the oppor and provide opportunities for engaging with the river. We'll also identify opportunities for innovation and additional partnership sites on the West Bank, as noted here at the corner of Washington and 19th. Thinking about restoring the core and making better utilize, utilization of your land in the core with a, a new academic expansion opportunity right at the heart of campus. And over the long term, think of ways to reposition parking more to the periphery so that we can really use that internal land for core educational and research purposes. That enables us then to think more broadly on West Bank about other strategies we want to make to connect the campus to uh, the East, in West, East Bank uh, pedestrian and bike circulation network as identified here in points one and two. And then also think about the open space structure and additional open spaces for students. Other improvements could include ch uh, changes and improvements to the Washington Avenue Bridge as we think of the years ahead. As we move to the East Bank, uh, the idea here is to really focus on the, uh, the health sciences and really the experience of utilizing the facilities. That's uh, brought about by the hospital relocation strategy. Also additional opportunities for clinical campus expansion and ways of thinking of uh, the parking and user experience, thinking of how parking can be integrated more effectively across the district. We're also embracing the ideas of innovation, what's already been planned for 2407 and for the East Gateway project, how those can be embraced and aligned with this planning process. We're looking to restore the core through academic expansion. Where are the opportunities to provide new academic facilities to support the mission? and new housing sites. Where is housing possible within this framework that we're beginning to establish? And how might that enrich the student experience and contribute to the inclusion go goals as well? We're looking for ways to make the campus more accessible and therefore more inclusive. Opportunities exist here as identified at the corner of Church and Essex once we begin this redevelopment process. We're also restoring the core by looking to the Northbrook Mall renewal strategy embracing that idea from previous planning efforts and making it a part of this effort moving forward. Uh, we're looking to enrich the student experience and make the campus more inclusive through the renovation of student-facing facilities such as Appleby and Morrill Hall. And looking for opportunities to engage the river visually as indicated here with Appleby Hall through a renovation of not only the building but the surrounding grounds. We believe that is possible. There are also sites identified for demolition. Uh, Pete called uh, Jim and, uh, and uh, the hall itself would be demolished as would the uh, Williamson building in order to make landscape improvements and better strategies for those areas of campus. As we consider East Bay further looking from the east toward the west, again, this idea of the hospital relocation presents significant opportunities in the design of the public realm and the use of land in this area of campus. Uh, additional clinical campus uh, expansion is possible, as is academic expansion through redevelopment along these major corridors that are being set up. Important to that as well is the idea of additional research expansion in the BDD area of campus and making better use of that land moving forward. The public realm and the opportunities for improving the Essex corridor for the first time in many years, we'll be able to connect it from Church Street to Huron, as well as uh, other landscape improvements that we can make around the stadium moving forward and along the Delaware, Delaware Avenue corridor itself. So all of those become important public realm improvements to enhance this area of campus. And then again, aligning with the ideas of the East Gateway and making sure this planning effort promotes and aligns with those strategies for the East Gateway. 
as we consider other ideas at work on East Bank, we're beginning to look for opportunities for engaging with the river further, the, the river flats area and how students could better access that area of campus and the opportunities that area would present for land acknowledgement uh, for the indigenous communities, an important part of their history and cultural tradition in this area. As we consider St. Paul, the ideas here really, again, support innovation with the partnership district that's been identified and the opportunities for Biomade in this area. Enriching the student experience through additional animal teaching facilities in this area. Also, uh, the idea of restoring the core, the campus commons, and uh, additions and uh, changes to the McGraw Library that would really make a better student experience. Uh, thinking about student-focused space and on the current site of the, the student center and how that could be aligned with the existing Bailey and other opportunities to engage students. Restoring the core through more research renewal and new additions to research in the heart of campus. Thinking about the health sciences through veterinary medicine renewal as part of the 2018 strategy for this area of campus and community engagement opportunities, looking for ways in which we can bring the community in to all of the great opportunities offered on St. Paul. And uh, that would be through a new community outreach center. Also thinking about student life and student en enriching the student experience by uh, new housing on the Commonwealth Terrace site and thinking about how that could be better integrated into CORE campus moving forward. As we stand back and look at St. Paul, other ideas at work here include opportunities to uh, promote uh, more um, partnership opportunities, the mixed use development as indicated at number nine uh, through private partnerships with uh, local business and also ways, thinking of ways to redevelop the Commonwealth Terr Terrace altogether. That comes along with landscape renewal opportunities as indicated at number 10 associated with the Sarita wetlands. And then finally, sustainable strategies. Uh, some of the recent work at, in the Como area would be continued in this process, uh, providing several opportunities for additional sustainable strategies as we move to the future. So all of that to say these big ideas are being aligned very carefully with the campus environment. We're aligning them with um, the Impact 25 and looking for ways in which we can better illustrate and narrow this in the weeks ahead. So we'll continue to adapt and uh, move forward with the, this type of thinking. And uh, with that, uh, Mike is going to take us through some final comments here. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Regents. Um, our overview of the future campus is depicted here by the dominant type of activity expected in each of these districts. I'll just take a few moments to highlight some of those changes as we foresee as we build toward the planned future. So we can skip. On the West Bank, a number of key projects are anticipated in support to support innovation and academic expansion. The opportunity site noted here is on the north and may be considered for student life needs for such as recreation or academic expansion. On the East Bank, the greatest area of anticipated development is on the eastern edge of campus with the siting of the new clinical campus, including a future hospital and clinical growth around the clinical and surgery center. This will be adjacent to significant private sector development in the East Gateway and 2407 Innovation Districts, which is itself next to the University Biomedical District, which it has room for continued growth of university research. Other areas of the university will see reinvestment in the academic core, such as the Knoll, the Mall, and Health Sciences academic areas, at times through renovations and at times through decommissioning and redevelopment. The vision for the St. Paul builds on the recommendations of the 2018 St. Paul District Plan. Significantly, we are already seeing progress in developing the partnership district with the microbial cell production facility and the BioMade partnership. On the south side of the campus, we know that there needs to be reinvestment in student housing for graduates, professional, and family house student housing. An anticipated mix of use, anticipate mixed use development as well on the southern border to enhance the neighborhood and a commercial services to the campus. We also see areas of opportunity for new uses over the 10-year time horizon that include the continuing, edu continuing education center and the golf course. Finally, we see reinvestment in the central Buford Avenue as the main street of campus with housing, library, transit, and student center. 
Since the beginning of this effort, we've reached out to the campus via surveys, focus groups, and meetings with university leadership. Our consultants have also reviewed our last master plan and many planning efforts since that time. We look forward to your feedback today and bringing you a full plan for review in October and your, and your action in December. And I turn it back to Senior Vice President Franz for the wrap up. Mr. Chair, uh, Vice Chair Sviga, members of the board, uh, we, we really are excited about this opportunity to engage not only you, but the entire university community in terms of thinking about our priorities, because these documents do guide us in the future. They do provide us with a, with a roadmap of, of where to go. And uh, with that, we'd be happy to take questions from the board. Just a quick question on a number of these um, <clears throat> illustrations. You'll uh, identify various buildings, existing building, proposed building, or context building. Um, on the proposed building, are, are we talking about that these are build there are existing buildings there? We're talking about tearing them down, decommissioning them, building new buildings, or are we talking about this is vacant space and we're anticipating new buildings? That's one question. And the other is, what does context building mean? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent, um, so to the first question, um, it's a combination. So some of them are anticipated to be new buildings built on existing other sites. So there, you can see a new opportunity on the existing site of the Mayo building, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a variety of buildings that we think would create space, versus other ones like Williamson or Pike we anticipate being green space and not a new development site. And so it's a mixture of both of those things. Um, and the, to your second question, I'm, I'm was not as clear on that. All right, well, I'm looking at these various maps and there'll be, it's a beige color, it says context building, and I don't know what that is. That's just referencing buildings that are off campus that are part of the context that we do need to consider as part of this planning process. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Regent Mayron, follow up? No, thank you. Okay, good, uh, Regent Grosh. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, these, these are important discussions. Um, uh, the, it, it's easy to think, well, this is way out in the future. And so, yeah, this is a general concept because a lot of people see these things as locked in and, uh, and off we go. So I think it's a really important dialogue. I've got um, kind of two, two different areas in, in, in particular uh, of interest. Um, so. Uh, I'll talk about this first, and Mr. Chair, maybe if there's a chance, I'll come to my other uh, other topic. But um, you know, if there's a, a single kind of immediate need on our campus, and you've heard me say this before, but we've got a terrible shortage of student housing already, and and it, it goes a little bit into my second question because when we talk about this, you know, the the biomedical discovery district buildings and so on. Um, I don't know where we're going to find an opportunity to address the student housing and, and for the other members of the board if you we have the fewest number of dorm beds per pupil of, uh, in our conference and we know that dorms are good for retention academic performance and safety and security and if there's a school in our conference that needs to, to address safety and security right now you know as, as we had in the, the report earlier today we've got a, a, a very we have an issue and and this is something that is not, I don't think it was ever intentional. Um, 35 years ago, we were uh, overwhelmingly a commuter campus, but now we're a residential campus. And so I think that finding an opportunity for, uh, to, to advance student housing immediately is really critical. And you know, I don't, maybe you can address that, but as I look at it, a lot of this is, is well out in the future. It, you know, you have um, student housing being pushed back. You know, as the medical district kind of pushes through, we're losing a couple of super block dorms there um, and you know in, and then on the other side where we do have some space for building we're, we're building research buildings I don't know to what extent researchers are walking across campus to a building but I do know that a dormitory you have hundreds of people every day walking multiple times from those buildings to classrooms and and so on and so you know I, I put a really high priority on on that interior space for students to have you know convenient and safe access to to their academics could you could you address how this deals with housing in the in the very near term as well as the long term um, and and you know it appears that there's an ex expansion of housing on the St. Paul campus which may work but for our certainly for our undergrads the vast majority are on the Minneapolis campus could you just speak a little bit to the student housing needs 
Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Roche, I'll start. I think one of the things we clearly uh, understand and, and appreciate, the, you're right about the success, certainly about the success of students in university housing. You know, the University of Minnesota is a rather unique Big Ten university being in a metropolitan city like this. And you know, right now, um, the private sector has created a significant amount of housing in this area. In fact, the private sector has added over 20,000 new apartment beds adjacent to campus over the last 20 years. So the private sector has sort of responded to this opportunity that, that's been presented here. Uh, but one of the things that we try to do is to follow th thus far has been following the guidelines by the board, and that has been to make sure that we have housing for on-campus housing for 90% of our first-year students, 25% of the students who lived on campus their first year, but who want to remain on campus going forward, and 10% of our incoming transfer students. So part of what we're in right now, we have enough housing to meet those needs. But as we look into the future, I think that's one of the reasons uh, I can let uh, Mr. Havens talk about the interaction with the river. As we, as we make some of these big moves with the medical district being moved over uh, adjacent to the, um, uh, to the uh, East Gateway area, it provides an opportunity along that area for some more housing, which is close to some of the other housing. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, the, the idea of the, with the new housing redevelopment there is to provide opportunity for replacing housing, but also in the process, create the types of housing that would be more inclusive it would create those welcoming environments that would enrich the student experience. So that location in particular not only offers you the views of the river, but connectivity back into the core, which I think gets to some of the, the points you're raising about opportunities to engage students more meaningfully in their educational experience. So thinking of that as an opportunity to not only provide the housing, but provide it in a way and in a in an location that enables you to, to address some of those goals you're, you're setting out. Uh, that rich experience and engagement process. Yeah, well, just to, just to respond, I, you know, I understand that there may have been some metric that the board at some point in time, you know, the 90%, and the, but again, it's, you know, the data is the data. We know we have fewer. We know, you know, other institutions would, would have the ability to have private sector step in. If there's a market, there's a market. But we do know that controlled access is important for security. Um, we know that that there is a you know I, I don't know what the rest of the region's you know email inboxes look like, but you know parents are really concerned and and being able to provide something more than saying well the private sector is going to handle it, I think that's smart for us um, to be moving in that direction. I don't know that. So the, the short of it is this plan doesn't have any immediate opportunity to expand student housing. Is that accurate? I think there, there could be opportunity to increase the number of beds on the sites that have been identified if, if that were the direction that were taken in future. Yeah, and just, Mr. Chair, just that, yeah, I, I think this is critical. I think that demonstrating our concern about this and our capacity to address, again, we're, we're outliers and, and I don't think in a good way. And so from that standpoint, I would, I would strongly urge that this reflect an opportunity to immediately expand that, that uh, um, provision to, to students that, that seek that. In, in the families that are concerned. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Regent Kenyanyan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and presenters uh, for the presentation. Just a couple of comments and questions. Um, you know, I had a similar question to Regent Mayron about the, the footprint. Um, and uh, I guess my only comment in that is, is um, I guess we're obviously still trying to figure out what um, what the future of work will be, obviously giving employees added flexibility. And we're also having uh, substantive discussions about online learning. And we're obviously not you know, gonna become an online campus, but um, you know, how does that factor in into our master plan decisions? And you know, capital projects are, you know, they tie you down, right? And, and while we're having those discussions, it might be important to make sure we factor that in and understand what, um, what will be what, what will be necessary um, and what functions and what academic um, things of that nature. Um, and then another comment and a brief question. The other one is um, sustainability. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I didn't expect to see it on a presentation of this format, so I'm not saying it's missing, but um, you know, as we continue to, as you continue to uh, formulate this plan, I, I think that should be front and center, um, should be a, a priority of ours, it's a priority of our students and whatnot. And I know it's an area we're already leading on, but not just 
you know, not just thinking of how an individual building is sustainable, but, you know, as, I mean, you look at the added and proposed buildings, it's a significant chunk of campus, right? So as a system, right? Mm -hmm. And with the utilities and all that, right. VP Burles, I'm not gonna pretend to, <laughs> to know what I'm talking about there, but uh, you know, I, I think that's clear. And then the last one, which is the question is about transportation. Um, and I guess specifically near the East Gateway, um, you know, medical campus region, Huron and whatnot. And I think, you know, when we discussed East Gateway, Last year, this did come up, and um, I asked about it. I know others did, and um, you know, obviously, they said, you know, we don't know we're going to work on that, you know, which is true. But you know, as as a, as the plan is developed, um, I, I would hope for, even if they're, you know, proposals and whatnot, just something more clear because, you know, what's proposed here. It's going to increase traffic by a lot, right? You know, the East Gateway and the medical campus, and that the you know we all know what what that area is like, and and the amount of traffic that it can support. So, just any comments on what thoughts we have on transportation? I'll start. I can start. Oh, well, transportation is a big focus of this. We're working with Kim Horn, who are very familiar with the East Gateway area and have been engaged in previous planning processes. Uh, they are in the process of working with us to examine the parking demand that will be generated as a result of new development and then also the transfer of demand that will come as redevelopment moves east. So that's being considered in the background traffic patterns as well as future traffic patterns for that area. So that goes along to say that uh, it's in part entwined with another point you raised on the future of the workplace environment and how things might transition. So. It's a bit of speculation at this point, but we're trying to look ahead to, to understand how mobility patterns could change as uh, potentially more people work from home more often and what that might do to reduce parking demand and therefore traffic. So you know, that sort of thinking will be embraced by the plan and be addressed in the plan itself. Um, that gets to sustainability, another point you raised. Um, obviously, the less driving we do to campus at least with current technology, uh, the, the more sustainable that's going to be. But I think the opportunity with this redevelopment is significant in that you're developing new building types that can employ better technology and better uh, use of energy moving forward. So uh, you know, all of that to say that many of these things are embedded in the thinking and will be part of the way we ultimately present the plan and present an integrated strategy for all those elements. Uh, that you brought up. Mr. Mr. Chair, I might just add to, to your first point, uh, Regent uh, Kenyanya, on the new space development. I mean, just recently, as one of the, one of the next uh, big projects is the clinical research facility that we're working on uh, that's on our master plan and been put before you uh, for fairly soon, we hope, in, in a matter of years. But already, this, with this last year, and the experience that we've had with COVID and, and that building is being reimagined, redesigned, and that's gonna happen. I'm sure you're seeing it, Greg, around the country. That's gonna happen with everything we do, actually. I mean, you, you really, you can no longer just say, well, we need a building to do this and not rethink how that building should interact with people going <coughs> forward. And, and I think certainly the clinic, I was struck by the clinical research facility and the amount of work and redesign that went into thinking about how that facility should partner with the, uh, the clinic, the surgical clinic that's already there. So, uh, and it's becoming part of our plan just around campus as we've talked about re-envisioning Morrill Hall and how we move out of the administration moves out of there. Well, what do we need where we go, right? So, I mean, every, every single step we make is now informed by rethinking what kind of space do people really need to work now in a way that makes sense and how do we utilize the square footage more effectively that we have. Because it's, you know, it's expensive. We have a big footprint, right? And we have a, a it's expensive to maintain that footprint. We've got to be smart about how we do that. But that was a really, that comment really struck me as something that we're working on a lot. And I'm sure Greg's seen it around the country. All right. Uh, yeah, just, just a brief comment, not a question. But uh, appreciate the comments. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm happy to hear that, you know, we're thinking of all those and they are intertwined, you know, but if on transportation, um, we're thinking, you know, or, or unsure, but maybe speculating that we may have less people, um, you know, on those roads because of the future of work, and then it would lead me to think, do we need 
more buildings and whatnot, you know, if, if there's less people, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd expect to see that reflected there as well. And, and that's not a question, just some yeah. thoughts out there, um, you know, but if, you know, if, if someone's working two days on campus and they're not the other three days, should that office be open for those three days? You know, um, you know, I know the place I work, there's a lot of people who work out of Minneapolis, but the office is tiny, right? Because people aren't always in there. So I'm sure it's all being considered. Um, but uh, yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, let's, we've got two more. If we can have two brief, brief questions, Regent Farnsworth and then Regent Millen, and then I'm gonna call it. Uh, thanks, Chair Powell. Mine will just turn into a comment because uh, Regent Rocha actually covered uh, the ground that I was uh, going to talk about, which is student housing, but approaching it from a different lens uh, instead of uh, safety and security, which is, of course, important um, about, or I want to approach it from affordable student housing. Um, I would be, I felt, rem I felt like I would be remiss during this presentation not to echo some of the concerns that I know um, folks in student government have had here on the Twin Cities campus and others um, around a lack of affordable student housing. Yes, the private sector has made great investments, particularly in Dinkytown, but not just in Dinkytown, um, around housing options. But um, there's a severe concern among students about affordable housing. And I know I was not on the board back then, but I know that was a specific concern from students around East Gateway, um, the removal of currently, or currently accessible affordable housing to put in the East Gateway development. Uh, so uh, more just a comment to echo what Regent Rocha said, but from the lens of affordable student housing. Um, in addition to safety and security. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Farnsworth. Regent McMillan. Thanks. I'll uh, make this in the form of a comment, too. Picking up on the last commenter and Regent Rocha's very apt point about how do we how do we sync this up with a housing strategy. And, and Vice President Franz went through the 90%, 25%, 10%, which is this current standard that the board has embraced, but before we put ink on paper with a new master plan, we certainly ought to, and I agree with Regent Rocha on this, we ought to refresh that. Because two thirds of the board at a minimum, that 90, 25, 10 predates them. And almost predates me and probably predates you. So um, it's time probably to look at that. I'm not ready to say I'm, I want to throw it out or rewrite it, but we've got to look at it both from a freshman and a freshman plus standpoint. And then also bringing into it the master leases that we as a board embraced, uh, Keeler, Radius, and what happens to the Umfria housing with East Gateway, which I think is very relevant if that's going away. You guys have a plan to replace it, and maybe it's what I call the up or the river view housing as you go upstream from Pioneer Hall, which I remember being in front of the board too a long time ago. So what's my point? Just simply that that all needs to get baked in and it is very important, but uh, I don't go into that baking in process with a sense that the 90, 25, 10 is wrong, but it certainly needs to be revisited. I think it's, it's high time to do that. Very good, thank you, Regent McMillan. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna, that concludes our discussion. Let me just say this for myself. I think the big eye, and I heard from other regions as well, the big idea of framing is, is really helpful. I, I mean, I think it yeah. just helps us uh, you know, get a, a better sense of you know, where this is going and what it, and what it could look like, and, and I think it can more in focus. So, so thank you very much for that, and I look forward to, to uh, the next update. So with that, um, we will return, uh, we'll turn to the report of the committees. But uh, I'm informed that the committees did not meet this. Morning, so, <laughs> so there's nothing to report. So, which brings us to old business. Any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? There being no additional business, this meeting is adjourned. I don't, he just can't even.